Hello, everybody. It is Wednesday night here in Bangkok, which means we are ready for another chapter of Field Gemology Talks. Uh, we're going to have a adventurous one here tonight. We're just going to be speaking with Peter Leichberg about pegmatites and adventures and uh, all kinds of good stuff. Um, thank you guys for being here once again. I know uh, some of you guys now are are not in lockdown anymore, and maybe this Wednesday uh, time slot is, is becoming less convenient, but uh, we're going to keep on going with it because we kind of feel like this is our night now. So, um, and we are so psyched because this is this is week number nine for us. So we have had so many awesome conversations so far, and I think we're going to keep on going tonight and into the future. If you guys haven't been with us before, definitely check out some of these conversations that we've had on previous weeks. They're all up on the YouTube, uh, Vincent Pardue Field Gemology YouTube channel. So you can go back and uh, revisit maybe your favorite one or maybe the one that you missed. Uh, maybe you wanted to listen to it while you were doing something else or while you're commuting or whatever. So you can go back and check those out. And um, yeah, I guess it's time that we uh, we get into today's today's topic. So, uh, Vincent, if you are ready, jump on in, and we will get going here. I see we have, as yeah. usual, uh, a lot of people from all over the world. Welcome, you guys. Um, so cool that we can see so many people week after week. I mean, I feel like so many of the names that we're seeing in the webinar, I know them now because I've seen them for the like, you know, for more than nine weeks. I have new friends, so that's cool. Yeah, there are there are obviously the same, uh, you know, uh, regular crowd, which is great. Yeah. Because at least, uh, you know, uh, I can see that these people don't get bored uh, about uh, what we say and uh, about these things. So it's uh, it's positive for for the feedback I have. It's positive for many people who uh, who uh, listen to us, and uh, it's also nice for the people you know I met in the field who uh, can get like that, you know, some uh, some exposure. So yeah, yeah this uh, webinar will continue for a while because currently the webinar calendar is full until uh, basically mid of August. So okay. and, <laughs> there and is uh, currently uh, six more webinars to come. And uh, after that, uh, I will see because I don't have... Uh, that many uh, field uh, contacts, you know, I cannot create them like that. And uh, we'll see. So probably uh, the, the concept might change on, or maybe uh, everything will stop maybe in August or something like that. Or maybe we'll go back to something else. I don't know. You know, we have time to think about that. But uh, for sure, you know, it will continue uh, at maybe, least uh, uh, until. Maybe a yeah. couple more people will become interested. You know, some of the, the people that we've asked, maybe a few more will say yes, and we'll be able to extend it on for a few more weeks. Well, yeah, oh, and already, you know, I get some feedback from uh, some of the people, you know, attending the talk, asking me, uh, can I, and, uh, you know, I took some of his feedback in uh, consideration, especially from a young geologist. And uh, and I was happy to, uh, to convince some of my uh, uh, geologist friend to, uh, come and uh, to, uh, to speak about that. And actually tonight, uh, you know, one of these uh, consequences is that uh, Peter is here. So Peter Lindbergh will uh, speak to, uh, to us tonight. Uh, oh, actually, we will discuss with him about uh, one uh, subject he's very, very passionate about, which is uh, pegmatite. And so what's your, uh, what's your history with Peter? How do you guys know each other? Well, uh, we met uh, in a trade uh, conference, and uh, we were at the same table. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I learned about him by, you know, people telling me about uh, this guy, you know, from Sweden, who was basically doing a little bit what um, I was doing, going to the field to collect sample, except that he was not really doing that for, for a lab. But uh, he was very, very uh, highly uh, recommended by many people. And uh, at several occasions, I had the pleasure to uh, sit down. And uh, we, we heard about each other by other people. And when we had the occasion to start to speak, you know, it was like a blast. And we, we could not uh, end uh, speaking to each other. So he became basically an instant friend because I saw that we had exactly the same passion for 
going to the field, meeting the people there, the miners, and, uh, and being able to see where the stones are from. Okay. So he is really one of the persons that uh, I really would like to travel with one day, but uh, I was not able to do that yet. But uh, yeah, maybe one, one day after this uh, COVID thing, we'll be able to uh, get a chance to uh, spend some more time together in the field. Okay, so uh, why don't we bring him in? Peter, if you're yeah. ready, um, you can unmute and uh, I will invite, oh yeah, good. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, good evening, Bangkok. <laughs> good evening, gentlemen. Where August. are you, uh, where are you coming from tonight, talking to us? Uh, I am in Luxembourg for the moment, working, teleworking. Cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, welcome. How's uh, how's things going over there? We haven't spoken to anybody in Luxembourg in any of the talk yet, so we don't know it's what's going very on. Very calm now, so uh, we have very few cases. Border open to to Germany a few weeks ago. Uh, over Easter, I had hoped to go back to Sweden, but that was the borders closed between Denmark and Sweden, and then border to Germany closed, so that was not possible. So mm -hmm. I spent I, I was never ever during such a long period at home without going to a mine or I do a lot of traveling in my work also. So uh, it's fantastic to be just home with family for so long period. Yeah. Kind of like Vincent, you're feeling kind of the same way though, but maybe not so happy about oh, it. Well, you know, I, uh, regarding confinement last year, I had sciatica for two months. I was blocked in my bed. I could not even go to the toilet alone. So I have some, you know, it's pre, pre COVID-19 experience about confinement. And then also I broke an arm a few years before uh, while going in the field. And um, it took me also about three months or three, four, uh, no, four months before to, I broke my arm in April, May, June, July, August, September, five months before to go to the field again. So five months before to, yeah, you know, we are February, March, no. March, April, May, June, yes, July. Right. You can August. In August, in August, it will it will be uh, at least uh, for the past uh, thirty years, either working as a tour leader or working as a field geologist. I don't think I have spent more than five months without going somewhere for the past thirty years, except with the broken arm. Yeah, yeah. So, Peter, um, I guess we'll start out with the most simple question: Who are you? for our audience, you know, what's your background and uh, how did you, I, I know you have a unusual passion and specialty. So maybe tell us a little bit about how you got to that point in your life. Yes, well, uh, when I was just a small kid, I was just one year old and my grandfather was putting gravel on the road to his house, just a small walk pathway. It was gray granite and I was sitting there. I couldn't even walk yet. So I was just over a year old. And I just saw this beautiful few piece of white quartz, red uh, microclean feldspar, and a few small um, uh, flakes of muscovite, like like your nail. And I picked them. And somebody, you know, of course, you don't remember this, but somebody gave me a small matchbox. So I had this matchbox for many many years after with my collection. And then uh, when I was two years old, I collected pumice that came floating on the ocean. And uh, by the time I was eight, I was collecting a bit, but I was interested in everything in nature, volcanoes, of course, uh, uh, you know, different astronomy and so on and history. And by the time I was eight, I was pretty much into geology, mineralogy, and I had a collection, of course, when you're a child, you need to gather samples. And I was scouting the whole Swedish West Coast by asking every farmer whether there were some old quarries or mines and so I really started in the field. And by the time I was 10, I've been to quite a lot of mines in Sweden and Norway. And then it just continued. When I was 13, I was in the USA the first time and I traveled in Europe. And uh, when I was 11, 12, I went to Norwegian mountains on my own. When I was 13, I was in the Swedish mountains, two weeks with a backpack and up in the mountains. And you know, by the time I was eight, nine, I was taking the streetcars in the afternoons in the city each streetcar line, each bus line, and scanned, you know, systematically every hill and every road cut in the city and as far as I could get. And then, of course, if we travel with the family, I was, I was having maps ready, you know, when I was eight, nine, ten. And I said, well, in three kilometers, could maybe, well, maybe make a right turn. It only takes half an hour to check this mine out. 
<laughs> so, so we did that all the time. And of course, my parents were getting a little annoyed and my mother was wondering, what are you going to do with all those rocks? You can't eat them. Nobody was a science. They interest. I, you know, when you're a child, and my parents and even the geologists and museum natural history, they knew some of the minerals. But then when I was eight, I noticed that the geologists had found columbite crystals and I found plumbo microlite. So I showed him the one and he said the second one was the same, which I saw it was not the same. So the following month on a Sunday, I brought an azurite from Chassillon, where I had a specimen, and I took a piece of quartz and I took a uh, copper sulfate and crystallized in the pocket. And I brought him the azurite, it's azurite, okay, but second one, it's also azurite. So I know that he didn't really know what he was talking about. So that was a problem. So I didn't have a good mineralogist uh, that I could learn from until I was 10 who was a mineralogist at the university, by chance I met him. Uh, he was my first really good mentor. And at the same time, I met a gemologist in a jewelry store in town. He was a very good gemologist. He had really, really good knowledge. So I, uh, I, at the same time, I started to subscribe to Lapter Gemma. So in fact, I studied on my own. And uh, I think the most important was field experience. And it's not only those most beautiful crystals and most beautiful deposits that give you the most knowledge. It is to, to observe everything where there is almost nothing. You see, you find some small epidote crystals, but you study the whole geology and from the big picture geology in a road cut, you can understand and learn where there could be some small nice crystals or interesting. So in fact, my interest is all kinds of geology, all kinds of mineral deposits, but I especially studied many ore deposits which we have a lot in Scandinavia, many elements were discovered in Scandinavia. And then I would say only since, well, when I was eight, I found a pocket in a pegmatite. So that was the first uh, gem pocket, so to speak, that I found. So that's 50 years just now, May, June. That's just 50 years ago. And, and then by the time I was 13, then I had found many, many interesting things, beautiful pegmatites. I really had seen hundreds and hundreds of pegmatites by the age, uh, age I was 13. I, roamed the whole Swedish West Coast. And by the time I was 18, I had traveled most of Scandinavia. And then I had a, a huge collection and I was smart enough to realize when I was 25, I saw those old collectors, 60, 70, 80 years old, who had a, a house and a barn filled with minerals. And I had that already when I was 18. And I didn't want my children and grandchildren to have to take care of 20, 30, 40 tons of rocks. So I was just 25 and I started to give away most of my collection because I had studied. Of course, I was teaching at the university also and uh, many samples I gave to university, drill cores and all kinds of things, but uh, you just cannot have so, so much rocks. I really had tens of tons of, of mineral samples, rocks and with, you know, big boulders with some rare crystals and things. And they were extremely good for that locality, but I'm not a national museum, so luckily I gave up that, and now I have more books than, of course, I had some more scientific samples that I analyzed and so on. So I was wise enough, I think, <laughs> to, to give most away of those samples. I still have some that I can use for teaching and so on. This is a crazy story. This, this might, I think you have the craziest story, origin story of any, any person we've talked to, because nobody here has come and said, okay, at one year old, I started, I think maybe you must have been a gemologist in a past life or something. You came out of the well, womb thinking about stones. It's interesting because my son was exactly one year old, one month. So he was maybe one month younger than I, uh, or perhaps the same. And we were in Sweden and we went to Bulgaria for a week. He just sat down, he picked up and the funny thing, he couldn't uh, walk yet. So the funniest thing was we were in the house, we were renting, we had a terrace outside. We arrived late at night. In the morning, he sat on the sofa next to me having breakfast. And we went in, did the dishes. And then suddenly I opened the big door to the terrace and he crawled. I've never seen him crawl so fast. I, I said, my come, let's, where is he going? When we came out, he went over to the neighbor's plot where the terrace was ending with a one meter wide zone of pebbles. He was right over there starting looking at the pebbles. And I had never shown him any minerals, but he had spotted that from the breakfast. The, the moment I opened the door, he just took off. 
And it was really funny. And every time he came out of the swimming pool, he could swim at the time already, but couldn't really walk. He was crawling out of the pool. And he would stop by the flower pot and stand up and look at the stones. And outside the shop nearby, he would sit down. And I took pictures of him looking and really studying the pebbles. That's, and my wife said, that's really genetic. It's, uh, <laughs> so he did exactly the same as I did, the same age, you know? Yeah, and this kind of thing is just, you know, I started uh, gemology. Uh, I, I really had, an, I, I found gemology on the late because, you know, the book that is behind you, uh, when I found Ruby and Sapphire, you know, on my way back from a, a, a trip in, um, to Mogok in 1998, basically I was 29. There is one thing that I understood very quickly is that there were people like you who, you know, for already 20, maybe five years, I was, I was 29 and they were 20, 29. And they had maybe already 20 or 25 years of experience. So I was thinking, how can I, you know, reach in a reasonable time, a professional level, when you have people who found, you know, that vocation on that passion 20 years before you. Yes. And, and then I, I, I found one shortcut. There was only one shortcut that I could use. Going to the field, of course, doing as much, looking at as many stones as I could. But the shortcut was reading books and taking advantage of the great knowledge that some people were nice enough to compile in book, like the one you have uh, behind you, Ruby and Sapphire. And when I, I spoke to Richard, but uh, I think that maybe you can, you can agree with me, Richard told me that uh, he got the idea about writing Ruby and Sapphire because he saw uh, Emerald on all the barrel by Sinkankas. Exactly. Emerald, not the barrels. That was, of course, earlier than Rich's late, later books. And that was one that really, we had many good uh, local geological uh, publications in Scandinavia about geology, about ore deposits primarily. But it was not so good in the direction of mineralogy and gemology. So that was Lapidary Journal I got in when I was 10 years old subscription, which was fabulous because that year they found a big pocket in California. Terminal Queen Mine and one one in New Remain also. So so that book, I, I, in fact, I, I have a few books that I am going to put put in the shelf, and that's the Emerald and Other Barrels by St. Agnes. And that, this one was fantastic because it had so much references. So, for instance, well, we could take anything here. Let's go to. Uh, I had a dream since I was a young boy that I was to go and see the Ural Mountain. Deposit there are pegmatites with rare minerals in Ilmen primarily. There are some gem pegmatites there as well in Mursink Alabash carrier. But if you just look at the, here are the references. Of course, I went through everything and I prioritized. I went to the university library, I ordered all of them. And so this is something like 1880 references. And of course, in many of them, I found many more. So just from that book, in total, probably 250, 300 references with the side references that, that I read on the Euro uh, or Soviet pegmatites, I should say. And I have some of them here. You know, even some of them are, are books by themselves. Uh, when I was a student, I could not afford the book, so I had to copy. Yeah. So, Dragoceni and Svetnikhan, so the gemstones by Firstman, 1925. So I cope with everything. And uh, of course, now I have quite a lot of first month that I could manage to get later, even in France, the pegmatics in French. Yeah. Uh, but, but for me also, it was if I had had the library I have now as a child when I was eight years old, I would know so much more. Because you know, kids are very receptive. I would know every word by heart in here. <laughs> of course, I know some of it, you know, that's for sure, but <laughs> still. <laughs> I, I wish all gems, so that's good now when gems and gemology and other publications are uh, online. So people have a chance. If you have the interest, you can find it. And in that, uh, you can look at mineralogy because I really, till I was 10 years old, I lacked the literature. I, I read everything I could get my hold of, but, but it was not that much. And I got full access to University Geological Library. The librarian was so nice. She let me stay there after closing time, six o'clock. So I could stay in the university library at nine, 10 o'clock, the geological library alone, 
going through all the literature, reading the maps, just make sure to close the door. And that was great. It was just that they didn't have too much mineralogy. I would, from I was 10 till I was 13, I was there many nights a week, you know. I think that the greatest gift my parents uh, gave me when I was a kid, at uh, nine years old, uh, I was given an encyclopedia in 21 volume called Tout l'univers in French. Mm. It was, there was a lot of illustration, so it was okay for kids. But there was all the time a double page about one subject, a subject about history, a subject about uh, animals, a subject about geography, a subject about many different topics, and 21 volumes. Every night, I was, uh, before to go to sleep, you know, when I was going to sleep, parents say goodbye and things like that. Then I was waking up and I was putting, you know, under my, uh, behind my, my door, I was putting some, uh, uh, closed in order for my parents not to see the light from my, uh, uh, you know, from my, uh, from my light. Yeah. And I was reading for about half an hour to one hour since the age of nine or 10. And, and this encyclopedia gave me basically a, a huge interest for many things from history to geography, to space, to, it was mainly about science uh, human science and things like that, uh, and, and it gave me a wide, a, a wide interest for for the world. Uh, I think that probably the best gift you can give to a kid is uh, the desire and the pleasure to read. Yes. And especially these days when we're speaking about again, okay, still about that today because about people trying to convince me to write books, but. Um, what I, the saddest thing I think with most of the people I go in the field with is that they don't read. And the second saddest thing is, number one, they don't read, and then they lie to me telling me that they read. And then when I found that they don't read, they say, oh, you know, your articles are too long, or there are too many, or stuff like that. And, and then I'm wondering how, what I will do with these people, because they don't read. And, I was able, they want me to help them to, uh, to become more like me. So, and the reason why I am now today is because I read a lot and I go to the field. But if I was not able to read a lot, I will not be able to do even 10% of what I'm doing. Because if you read a lot, when you go to the field, you compare what you have, all the knowledge that you have, uh, collected in your brain thanks to all the things you have read and you compare that with what you see. And this is called research when you have all the known knowledge with you and then when you look around, if you see something that is not uh, in this uh, accumulated knowledge, this is maybe something new. So you can add your piece of sand to the mountain of research. But most of the people that uh, travel, that ask me uh, some help, they don't want to read. And at the end of the trip, they tell me, Vincent, uh, I have a resume. Can you give me a, a letter? Can you make a letter telling that, uh, you know, I'm a great guy or da, da, da. So number one, they don't want to follow my recipe. And number two, they want me to lie about them. <laughs> they want me to, so basically they, they uh, like about reading and they want me now to lie about them and giving them a fake recommendation later. So they don't want to follow my recipe, but they want me to turn into a liar and to follow their recipe, which to me is a kind of, a, kind of, a, well, I will not say the word. Oh, which, <laughs> it's funny because my father, when I was nine or 10 years old, we moved to that apartment when I was eight and was shortly thereafter, but I'm not exactly sure which I was nine or 10. By 10, I know I had it. And he gave me also the Swedish National Encyclopedia with 50 bands. And there was some really good. I read, like you, about everything, but especially when I came to mines and minerals, that there were some good references. It was not a lot, but uh, there was a lot about science. I liked architecture and history. So I was a member of the Numismatic Society in my home city from when I was six till I was 11, 12. I was collecting Swedish coins. And of course, there also, there is a lot of knowledge. Where did the ore come from? Where was it minted? Who made the design? Who was the mint master? And you know, 
1908, the tour, they printed, they made only 2,000 of them. That's why it was very rare and misprint and so on. So it's this, this um, I think the thirst for knowledge, that's the key thing because these shortcuts, if you have a person who is, who is so lucky that he gets to travel with you and is not prepared to study before and study after, what should be is during the trip, you know, it is uh, the a real person is uh, almost afraid to ask you from morning till evening and everywhere so to, to make you completely tired and, and not not ask for a paper that they're really good guy and know something i mean even if you take any of these books here it's a lot of information so i'm sure you're the, the same way but now when i get a new book if there's one sentence with something new or a connection that I didn't think about, that's what gives so... My mm. brother gave me a book a couple of years ago and it was big, nice, fancy book with nice pictures. So there was really, yes, maybe there was something, a specimen I hadn't seen or something, but there was one sentence in the beginning that verified something that I had been thinking, but somebody had... You know, written this long, long time ago in the early 1960s, which was very interesting. You know, because I'd never seen it printed before. So yeah, I, I really like to read. You know, sometimes in some old book, even 18th century, 19th century, you find something that you know written in a way that is just uh, excellent. M many quotes, many things that is sometimes you know so beautifully written yes. that you know you're amazed. Yeah. I'm amazed of, of uh, when I read some of the. What well, is go in French? You know, to really then the language change. It's not anymore like a recent French. It become like old French and become funny, and, and the actually the definition of the word is not the same. So then it lose a lot of meaning. But uh, but many of the old books were really beautifully written, and uh, and I think that yeah, you know, if in this period like with uh, COVID nineteen, I'm reading a lot. I'm yeah. I'm spending a before I was spending one hour per day reading. Now I think I spend about two or three. Mm -hmm. In these days, I'm spending two or three hours per day reading because in my library there are many books that I I don't have. There are actually some sometimes you have more book in a good library that you you don't have read but you want to read than the one you have read. And I have all the time more book in my library that uh, I I am. Maybe 40, 50 percent of the book in my library I actually read them. But yeah. uh, it's only the last few years that I have. Okay, this is only a tiny uh, fraction of my books. Yeah. I have many, many times more than this. But uh, it's only the last few years that I have more books that I haven't managed to. Before I read everything, as soon as I got it, <laughs> I typically read through the whole thing. Saturday morning, if you write Friday night, I read Friday night. I read all Saturday. And then I would re I would put notes, just you know, sheets of paper where I have to go back to and take notes, and I would put back. And I, <laughs> so it's nice when when you publish something. If you write an article, I had recently I wrote about Afghan pegmatites a couple of years ago in Minerological Record, and I had a friend. He called me up, and I got emails the same day it came out. One friend, he's professor of mineralogy, he called me up. He said, "Oh my God, this is the best thing I've read in 20 years." <laughs> but it was so funny because. He opened it. He didn't get, even get into his house when, when he opened it. He started reading. He just said, wait, wait, to his wife. He went and he read it from beginning till end. It was, it was so nice. If you give one person such a, such an enthusiasm to read about it, it's worth the whole thing to write it, you know, because uh, I didn't have plan to write it at all. And I was asked if I could write it. Somebody knew that I had studied for a long time. You know, I studied many, many different areas because I'm, I'm just gathering information because I'm curious. So I want to find. So I have notes and I take notes. And you know, every day I'm in, I'm in my car. I, I have page sheets like this. And some friend is calling me, so it's it's online. But then after I, I take the note to write away about different finds. And so I, I have boxes and boxes of, of notes. And then I, of course I put it all together. And, uh, mm. But Afghan Pegman, this was just a small fraction of all the information because I didn't have time to write a, really an article at that time. So yeah. Justin, when, when, you, when you read a book and you have the feeling that this is the best thing you have read for 20 years, for me, this is, you know, there are a few things that make me so happy than that, as happy than that, that you read something and you feel that, my God, you know, 
that you know buying that book was the best thing I did in the past three weeks or the past one month or maybe the past year because you know it's just great. I think it's an especially good feeling because not not that many books give you that feeling you know, or, or even articles. I know for me, one, one came out uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Gems in the Early Modern World, I think it was called. And I've gone back to that one so many times. It's new, it's articles, you know, a, co a compilation of articles, but like, it's so good. And the whole thing is so easy to read. It's written by a bunch of different people. And when I read just the one article I was looking for, I, I had that feeling that you're describing like, so many doorways opened in my head you know I, I just got and then you know and then of course you go to the bibliography and you're like wow I missed so many things but I wanted to go back for a second I thought it was really interesting how you were speaking about what Vincent when you were a kid and staying awake in the you know at night to uh to read for an extra two or hours I used to do the exact same thing I had this stick by my bed because I was at the top of the stairs and I had a stick by my bed that I could shut the light off with. So if I heard my parents coming up, the stairs were creaking, you know, because I was doing the same thing. You know, I had my book and I was under the covers reading with the light, with the, with the little lamp. And then when I'd hear them come, I would take the stick and turn the light off and pretend I was asleep. So, you know, just to get an extra couple of hours of reading. Same, but I was putting basically a, a blanket under the door because my, my parents' room were opposite of mine. And I was afraid that they could see the light, you know, from yeah, under the door. Yeah. But I was covering the light, and but I was putting the thing. In. Yeah. My parents knew that I was reading. Actually, they told me years later, so all my uh, precautions were bullshit. Yeah. I think but they were happy that, you know, I was reading. And of course, in the morning, I was a little bit sleepy and things like that. But uh, my father was waking me up. And uh, sometimes one day my teacher was uh, wondering because she was asking, is this guy uh, sleeping enough during the night? Because he seems that he's a little bit, you know, uh, in his world and uh, he forgets things. And my father told her, don't worry, he will not forget to, to come to school because I'm the one who brings him. <laughs> but actually I was sleepy because sometimes I was reading late, which yeah. is, uh, which my parents were feeling that actually, you know, if it's the worst thing that I do, it's quite okay. Absolutely. So we're getting on kind of a wild tangent here, even before we've begun. So let's let's bring it back a little bit, Peter. So we're we're talking about pegmatites tonight. Um, can you just give us a brief introduction? You know, for anyone who doesn't know, what what are we speaking about? What when we say pegmatites, what do we mean in the gem yes. world? Or in the I will do that very very briefly. So so when you have collision, for instance, India collided with Asia, and you have a mountain range, or oh, like the Alps of Rocky Mountains. Then usually you have huge magma chambers that crystallize underground. If they reach the surface, you have volcanic activity. But if it crystallizes at one to a few kilometers down, down to seven, eight, ten kilometers, and from this granitic style igneous, in, igneous rock, within the granite or in fissures leading out, you can have very late stage solutions, which is richer in, in, in water and richer in rare element like the smallest and the biggest ones that don't fit in normal mineral structure and they crystallize in veins typically but can be all different shapes depending on where it crystallizes and what you find there are most of gemstones not diamonds they don't form there and typically not rubies really but sapphires do and most you know everybody knows about the tourmaline topaz all the varieties of barrels even uh, emeralds and then you have a lot of rare minerals also and then the thing is, it's not only the pegmatites themselves, it is the context around this igneous intrusion. The heat from it, metasomatosis, from the hot water solutions that's heated by, which forms others. You could have like emerald deposits in many places of the world forming from the pegmatite solutions rich in beryllium. And you have, you know, chromium, vanadium from surrounding rocks. So you, you can have pegmatite veins, but you can also have these metasomatic rocks which is you know everything from the Urals to Australia to in between Afghanistan you have this type of de deposit and many other places of course Brazil and even even a little bit similar in North America one place but uh, even Spain northern uh, northwestern Spain just north of Portugal you have this kind of uh, deposit and of course Habachtal is very old deposit so within the pegmatite the crystal grains are much bigger than the granite and you can have crystals up to many meters in size, even 11, 14 meter long spodium in crystals. So they're very beautiful to look at. 
Mm. And in the last stage, in a few of those veins, you have cavities forming. And typically, the best quality, gem quality, is formed within cavities. So you have a crystal or barrel starting growing. It's not transparent. And then if we're lucky, some of the crystals in the cavity will be really beautiful and gemmy. And of course, from the formation itself and during later stage movement in the they will be, be, you know, break and crack and so on. So in the pocket, typical pocket, usually you found handfuls of broken bits and pieces of aquamarine and tourmaline. That is ideal, some of them for cutting, some for carving, cabochons, and a few to preserve as beautiful specimens as crystals. So that's the basic of pegmatite. So you can find incredibly beautiful crystals of gem, gemstone minerals, but also many rare minerals. So we don't think about it, but everything in modern society, it is based on minerals. Otherwise, we would have a wooden hut. We would not have much more. We would have a wooden plow. So, you know, most is from minerals. We started to use stones. Maybe we made a fireplace and a few of those rocks happened to be ores. And we saw that something, some metal came out. And of course, we found native iron in both native iron from earth and in meteorites and native copper. And probably by accident, it happened around the fireplace that they melted and some snows turned out in metals. And then they start fetching those metals and learned how to utilize. For instance, the computer we're using now, that's much of the uh, purest quartz is mined in pegmatites. Mm. So ultra pure quartz is mined in pegmatites to have the silica for the computers. And of course, everybody had watches in silica. And, and you, know, you don't think about it, the car, the, your house, the road, airplanes, everything, it needs to be mined if it cannot be grown. And of course, much of clothes and so on and the food is made of something we grow, but most things we utilize every day is, is from mining. Mm. And for growing things, you need tractors, you need tools that are also coming from mines. Yes, so, exactly. Okay, so you've told us You've told us a bit of your story, you know, obviously how you got into minerals as a kid. You told us about pegmatites. What we haven't found out yet is how you became so specifically interested in pegmatites and, mm -hmm. and also um, sort of the interesting fact that you didn't choose to go into gemstones professionally. You know, you've kept it as this passion. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you, how did you get so obsessed with pegmatites specifically? Well, you know, when I was uh, when I was a small kid, I found pegmatites around my, my grandparents' uh, summer house and the city where I lived. In fact, there were a couple of pegmatites running right under even the bedroom where I was sleeping, under our house in Göteborg. And in the playground, in the kindergarten, there were pegmatites just outside the kindergarten fence where pegmatites would. I managed to crawl out and get a biotite mica, black mica like this. When I was three years old, that was fantastic. The biggest I found previous was small muscoids like this. And then by the age of eight, as I said, I came to big pegmatite. And you could see those incredible. I found muscovites like this. I found topaz, 80 kilo, uh, you know, this big in diameter, topaz crystal. I found beautiful Amos night. I found this crystal cave when I was eight years old with beautiful feldspar crystals, white and, and reddish, and small muscovite roses, and beautiful clear quartz crystals. Some were citrine, some were smoky. And I protected this cave. I planted a spiky brush outside. And outside, there was a natural three-meter cavity I collapsed. And because I was so young, I had the sandbox tools. I sifted through everything, dug out the outer pocket. And I planted this spiky brush. And nobody should destroy my secret crystal cave. And I've only shown it. It was me and a friend who found it. And I've only shown it to my kids. And that is now 15 years ago. And I will take my son there one time. And I took my brother there. He will be 15 in September. And I took him there 45 years ago. He was four years old in the summer. And I will bring him back. And it will be very interesting psychologically because it was such a thing for him to go up in this mountain on a very remote island and find the pegmatite vein and see the pocket that it was small when we found it. We widened it so we could get in as small kids and see the crystals inside and some outside. And that is preserved. How how did you when you say you found a, a, a topaz like that? Yes. Were you using tools? You were digging for them, or you were finding them in caves, like exploring caves that were existing. That you were how you how were you finding? You know how you can find at eight years old uh, topaz crystal eighty <laughs> kilograms. 
Topaz, I found a, a bit, bit late, but I found many beautiful, I found Big Barrel when I was eight, eight years old in the airports. So I went to the mines. Before I was eight, I interviewed all the, the farmers at the countryside, wherever we came. If we visited some relative, I'd never been there far away. I would immediately speak with the farmers, the people around, where I them, is there any quarry around here or old mine? And just, you know, so this, this was the method for me. I didn't have, so they came a um, car center uh, shop with maps to my home city when I was probably 11 or something, which was even better than the university because there were topographical maps all over Sweden, economical maps. After school, I went there and I went through every, I could only afford to buy a few of them because they were pretty expensive. But I located every mountain that had a name that you could understand there were minerals or crystals or mines there. Sometimes mines were marked. And I took notes from every topographical map available all over Sweden. So for instance, near my home city, I found Glass Mountain, three names, three hills with the name Glass Mountain. And further north, crystals are named At. I found a lake, which was At, and several hills, mountains, which were named At. It means that there are crystals there. So we're having old place names. And I, you know, many place names has mine also, or quarries were marked. So, so that topaz I, I found in a book about quartz felts for mica. So in principle, it was about pegmatites. And it didn't mention anything about uh, the minerality of this place. It was just mentioned that had been found topaz, but not much more. So I went there. It was thick moss on the on the dumps. The water filled. Uh, there were two big pits, water filled, and this was really in the forest. And when I opened this moss, I remember still remember that it was like for me like coming to Brazil. Of course, I lifted. There was smoky quartz, rather transparent piece with white Clevelandite. There was purple and green fluoride, Amazonite, unbelievable. There was humid under the moss. There was even one piece like this bicolor, big Amazonite. I never brought that because it was so beautiful. I thought it should stay there for people to see. I found lipid like that. Least. I found topaz like this immediately. So you use crushed moss. Oh, I, 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 I there were some old peat, and then you you clean the peat and. I lift the moss and I dug under. I didn't want to destroy it because it looks so beautiful. You know, just lift this thick moss and I lift it up and I dug under and I, I found plenty of nice things in this place. But sadly, just three, four years later, somebody else found out and the locals were really angry because there came a big Volkswagen bus from Holland and they found so much Amazonite that they loaded it and went back to Holland and came back just to make money on it. So the locals didn't want anyone there. I was allowed to come, but they just did it for making money. So I always thought it was sad. The one thing is if they would ask the landowner to pump out the mine, to clean up the mine and mine something and study the pegmatite. That's another thing, but just to steal everything from the dump. I think it's much more valuable that the dump remains there. Pea families can bring their kids and everyone can find a few pieces. You don't need to have 50 kilo Amazonite at home. You know, it's no use. You can have a few pieces with different variety, different minerals. But I, I really always disliked this hoarding mentality. And I thought there were too many collections. Scandinavia had this where they would collect everything they could carry with them. I think that's not really the way to do it. But anyway, that's how I started. And I, I just from curiosity and going everywhere, I scanned every hill if I saw some veins or I saw on the map. So one place uh, I looked for during several years that was named Glass Mountain. I went there in the forest, it was nothing, nothing, nothing. And then it was just one little section of rock, a couple of meters that were exposed. There was also moss. And I saw a fissure in where there were a couple of really jammy, completely beautiful smoky quartz crystal, light smoky, I should say, because very beautiful. And I, I, I couldn't get in because it was very narrow, the fissure. And I had a long tool, iron bar, pry bar, and I could just try to get in as far. I could just manage to get two of those beautiful crystals out. And I showed it to one friend who is a good friend, and he was a gem cutter. He's in his uh, mid 80s today. And when he saw the quality, he said, No, no, this is not Swedish. This is from Brazil. He could not believe. No, no, no. And I said, No, no, I found it in a pegmatite uh, on the Swedish West Coast. No, impossible. So, you know, it, it, but that, I was looking for several years to find this. And I, you know, I'm a little crazy because I don't give up. If I think so, I'm going. So, when I was a child, I wanted to go to the Urals. And I started 86, I went to St. Petersburg. I spoke with Russian geologists and 88, I forgot 
better context. And they said, not even we can go to yours, even from Fersman Museum in Moscow. So, but I, I was the first Westerner who managed to see the Ural gem pegmatized and the emerald deposits in 1992, May, June. So, you know, if I want to go to a place, I, am, <laughs> I don't give up the idea, even if it would take me 50 years, I'm still going, you know. I guess that, you know, to go, to be the first guy to go to the Euro, it took you quite a while, you know, in the, uh, uh, speaking about logistics, because I guess that, you know, going to the Euro was not, you know, getting the um, trust of people to welcome you in their mind. It's something that sometimes, you know, can take years. Yes. And also, you know, just exploring around your place, because there are often, you know, young gemologists, like gemologists who don't have, you know, somebody to finance them who's told me, you know, how can I do what I can do to start? And I told them usually, well, just look around your place in your country. Maybe there is something interesting. Try to find everything in the literature about that and then go on site. And if you find something uh, new, basically, you know, you are doing research. You don't have to go on the other side of the planet to start doing research. You can collect everything that was published on your area and you start locally and then you will get a method. Because when you were doing that, for example, you were speaking about, you know, exploring this place in, uh, in Sweden. How were you doing with logistics? Were you doing camping? Because when I was a kid, I was born and raised in countryside France. When you were a kid, the further I was going away from home was about uh, five kilometers because a walking distance from my house, I was walking and I was, I mean, I was not looking for mineral because it's a sedimentary place. I was looking for deers. I was looking for, uh, you know, uh, foxes and uh, rabbits and uh, things like that. And like fish, story, you know? <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, uh, it's a forest and around my place, it's clay, there are no stones. <laughs> it's a hill with wines and one yard, but basically there are no stones. It's a clay area. Yeah. So logistically, you know, to explore all this place, how, how are you doing to go there? And were you camping and uh, how are you doing? Well, uh, you know, at my grandparents' summer house, we were there with all cousins during much of the summer. So we were many people going bathing and so on. But I, when I went exploring, I told my parents when I was three, I'm going to be an explorer. That's what I said, Forskningsreisande. So it means research traveler in Swedish. I saw that that's what I'm going to be when I, I said I was three when, when I told them. And they told me this many, many times. But uh, I, what I did, uh, I went out in the morning and I was needed to be back just after sunset in principle. And here I was on an island which was 15 kilometers long, as I mentioned about. But I walked just like you, five, six kilometers. I found small fissures with calcite, small pyrite crystals, small fissures with feldspar crystals. You know, I, I found everything there. I found some small barrels, garnets, tourmalines. And my grandfather, he owned a couple of small islands. He would go there sometimes for fishing. We went out. Sometimes he would help. help, help boat or no? Yeah, farmer to bring, bring some sheep. So I know, okay, on this island, I have three hours now. I would always go with my grandfather. 4.30 in the morning, go out fishing. And then he was helping a farmer to let some uh, animals graze on his island. No problem, he would bring the sheep or something in the boat. And I had a few hours and then I needed to be back. And the island was a few kilometers long. I would scout every one island. I found really nice purplish red garden, but there was only one big, in one vein on the whole island, you know, but. <laughs> I scanned every square decimeter. You need to look very carefully to find it. I was in a small cliff outcrop when I was a kid. But that's, it's interesting you say, because I can show you just one thing. Here is a small book, Kronstedt, from a Swedish chemist from 1782 or something. I, it's long ago. No, 81 it is. So it is mineralogy and the... Uh, and, well, it's about different. So he starts with diamonds and so on. And here I remember he mentions that in France, in a place, there's supposed to be sapphires. And he writes, this is probably rumors because people make stories, but this is 1781. And another... There are. Actually, yeah. uh, on a Roman, uh, Roman jewelry and things like that, uh, many, most of the sapphire from what I saw in a recent research article were coming from central France because the Celts were mining sapphire in the early yes, rivers. Yes, with gold. They were, I think, probably searching for gold and searching for gold, they found sapphires. Yeah. So, you know. 
Okay. Like many places around the world, people find gemstone like sapphire because they are actually searching for gold or some uh, metals. And uh, actually, this is something about gemstone mining that is very often uh, interesting is that, you, and especially about pigmentite, I think, you know, how difficult is, it is to plan to find <coughs> gemstones that are actually valuable, which is sometimes, you know, you mine for, I see miners, you know, mining for one year, two years, they don't get anything good. No. And sometimes at the end, they get lucky and they find a pocket, like people mining for Tanzanite, people mining for Savorite, they can spend a lot of time mining and pigmentite. I think it's about exactly the same. It's super difficult to be able to, uh, to, to plan to find something valuable. So usually you need basically to, if you can, uh, you know, have a mine, a mining plan, and you are mining something that makes some income regularly, like daily income. And from time to time, you know, uh, uh, as a side uh, product, you have a uh, gemstone that are coming that makes sense for many people. So I think that this is why many gemstone deposits are found like gold miners, because gold miner, actually, when you are going along a river, you know that if you are doing the right thing, you might be able to find nearly every day a little bit of gold that you will be able to sell. But uh, to find a, a gemstone that uh, you will be able to sell, it's uh, basically uh, you are taking luck as a business plan. But actually, usually it's not very wise to, to state uh, that, uh, okay, uh, my luck will be my business plan. No, no. You know, this what when somebody hears that... Uh, you know, I'm interested in do, do a lot of research in geology mineralogy. And soon, I mean, for me, gemology, that's just, you know, the top of the Kyops pyramid. It's really geology mineralogy is a huge area. And gemology by itself, it's an enormous area. If you look at one species, Grundle, as you see, you know, Richie Richard's book here, here it is. <laughs> here. Um, it's enormous much. And of course, Richard's summary, even each one of those deposits described deserves a whole volume if one really wants to describe it. So there is there is uh, so much information out there. And then for us to find something, if, you, if you're not among hundreds of pegmatite regions, go to one of the best ones and study hundreds of veins and you find the best ones and you go into and mine one of those veins, you may find 350 cavities. 30 of them have something which is better quality, barrel or topaz, for instance. Mm -hmm. And a few of them have something really good. So one mine in the Euros that I followed from the mining 30 meter level to the surface, uh, there were 338 pockets. And I would say there were four pockets with something really, really beautiful that should pay for the mining. And in general, most um, gem mines, hard rock mining, I would say yields one to two percent gem quality. In the river, it's all tumbled and broken, so you have a much higher percent of gem quality. And uh, in general, I tell people that even if you're mining big scale, maybe for industrial minerals, it's about every 10 years that you can expect to find something of gem quality or mineral specimen quality. That's the average of many, many places I've been to. Yeah, well, that's the point. We, people say, oh, we had an exceptional find, or there is an exceptional gemstone. Well. Exceptional gemstone are not commodities that you can plan to, fl to, to mine every week. No. Exceptional gemstone, it's exceptional. What does it mean? It means that you cannot make a business plan on something exceptional because it's an exception. There is a rule, you will find nothing valuable. And the exception is, you know, this exceptional gemstone that is actually valuable. So when, you know, people are mining in many places, they tell me, Vincent, how can I find, you know, a, a pocket of uh, you know good rubies or things like that. So then I look at them and I say, well, <laughs> well, you know, if I had the answer, I will not be doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I will be uh, probably the richest guy in the world. If you, if I could find a way, you know, to say, oh, you dig here for five meters and you will find a pocket of exceptional gemstone, I think that I will not be exactly doing what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Some types of pegmatites, in fact, you can see from the structure primarily. You don't need to see the gemstone, but you can see from the structure. We did it in the Euros, I've done it in Pakistan, I've done it in many places. So 
if you have many, many veins and you look at the structure, you can see on the structure where it's really, really well crystallized. So in the Euros, we put 13 different points and from the drill course, we looked at the drill course. Okay, here is five points, seven points, eight points, 13 points. So we made a contour of points, which zones of the pegmatite which would be the best. And there were two areas further away from the center that was looked to barren. So the mining company made a shaft to 30 meter, cross uh, tunnel at 20 meter, and it went about 60 meter wide. But it was only in the 50 meter core zone where we said that here would be good. But just for testing, there were no pockets at all further out. And uh, at the 30 meter level, the same, they came out to nothing in, in the end, and then they mined it all the way up. So looking at the structure, one can always try to look at geochemistry. They had already done that long time ago in the Euros. And I've looked many, many different areas, like in Pakistan, I told the miners it was a big cliff and the miners would climb for the whole day, 2000 meter up. And they could mine in three months. And I told them, why are you mining up there? Why don't you mine? I could just look at the cliff, huge cliff full of pegmatites. And you could see inundations where there had been pockets. You couldn't see the pockets anymore, but just from the structure, excellent with huge number of pockets with aquamarine, some black terminate, but the aquamarine is, well, and I said, you should mine here. Go underground, make tunnels, you can mine year round. And they did that, and they found the two biggest and best aquamarine specimens ever in Pakistan, exactly in this cliff. So I've been mining there now for 12, 13 years. I don't live in Pakistan. If I lived there, I would be mining there. But I gave them the free advice, you know. So I like to, to try to help people where I go. And they always appreciate that, of course, you know. So, But it's, it's nice... Uh, to have this as a hobby, I choose to work with something else. And then during my holidays, I go and study the post. And then the miners, they send me almost every day. I got pictures from miners. So this is what the structure looks like in the vein. We found a pocket. The only thing I want from them, I never charge a single penny for helping them. I just want when you find something or when you see some interesting structure, you take pictures. And nowadays, that's not a problem. So to Pakistan, I gave many cameras, even video cameras in the you know, 80s and 90s, because they didn't have uh, cameras. So I have received a few images from these cameras and the camera gave from the photographs their families more than the mines. It was very hard to get them photograph the mines. But uh, even from Madagascar, way back, that was late 70s, I would get a letter with one or two pictures because it was expensive for somebody in Madagascar to make pictures. And I would photograph the pegmatite and look at this. Does this look good? <laughs> So very cute. And maybe I have some of those letters with pictures still, you know. So I really agree with you on something is, uh, you know, when people ask me about a deposit, you know, after visiting for the past 20 years, many deposits, I start to get, I, I don't, I didn't study geology, you know, in my, um, in my, uh, when I was in university, I was studying uh, analytical chemistry, basically trace element chemistry, spectroscopy and things like that. So my background is more about working in a lab but I actually, I like to go to the field. And one thing that was very interesting uh, going around and visiting mainly uh, ruby and sapphire deposit because I was uh, falling down when uh, I read uh, the book at the back of your, you know, in your shelf, yeah. is that uh, visiting ruby and sapphire deposit, I mean, hard rock deposit, where the place where I saw the base quality for ruby and sapphire, funnily, there were some pegmatite nearby. So if you go to Mogok, there are two granitic intrusions, and around this granitic intrusion, you had some pegmatite. And you know, at a relatively close distance from uh, this place, you have some place with rubies and sapphire, and sometimes with you know, very fine gem quality. If you go to Vietnam in Lokien, Yente, you find also some pegmatite with some tourmaline in uh, Mintien, not very far from the place where you have the best uh, rubies and spinel. When you go to Tajikistan, at the ruby mine, just on the other side of the mountain, you have Rankul, which is a pegmatite area, where you have these uh, great uh, rubies, and then uh, a little bit further, you have this uh, place with pegmatite. You even, you even see the mica vein from the rubies, national in Nadesta. You see the pegmatite right above on the next hill, you know, mountain, 5,000 meters. When you go to Madagascar, 
when you go to uh, North Mozambique, when you go to South Tanzania, you see all these granitic dome nearby and around this granitic dome, this Inselberg, you have pegmatite. So uh, when I was looking at all that, uh, you look at the place where you have the best quality rubies and sapphire in many cases, and when you see the granitic dome nearby, not exactly just next door, like 200 meters, but in the area, it seems that uh, it's just a field observation, but there might be a correlation. And, it's and actually, I was, I was all the time wondering about something, and I, I never saw any publication about that, any research about that. Uh, I was discussing with you about that one day. Uh, there is what I call the pegmatite belt that I never read any book about it, but I, anyway, I call that the pegmatite belt. Starting from Nigeria, going to Brazil, then going to Namibia, then Zambia, then Mozambique, then Madagascar, and then India, because they were all together. That's the great pegmatite belt. And then there is the other one, you know, India collided in, uh, in uh, Asia. And on both sides, you had uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan with some uh, pegmatite. And then on the other side, you had uh, Burma and Vietnam with also with some pegmatite. So you find a good quality rubies on sapphire, not very far. You have also some fluid and sometimes some granite, you know, that came and heat. And, and you have gem quality material. Now, when I look at East Africa, on Africa on the general, what is amazing for me is to see that, you know, you have this pegmatite belt that is crossing what we call the Mozambique belt. And just at the junction of these two belts, you have Madagascar, North Mozambique, and South Tanzania. Yeah. And when you look at the whole uh, ruby and sapphire in East Africa, this is the place where you have the stone with the best crystallization. Most of the uh, corundum, you know, when you go to the north of the Mozambique belt, they are like Cabochon grade or industrial grade, but they are not gem quality. But when you go to the south, close to the so-called pegmatite belt, then you have gem quality. And this is something that uh, I'm not, I was not uh, uh, just the only one to think about that. And I, I, I saw that uh, John Saul in his book, uh, A Geology Speculates, He's also wondering about this is why, you know, in the south of the Mozambique belt, it seems that corundum are much better quality than in the north of the Mozambique belt. So he thinks that there is something doing with maybe pressure, that the pressure was uh, lower in the south of the Mozambique belt. And if you have low pressure, you have less uh, maybe stress, you know, the crystal can grow maybe uh, transparent gem quality crystal basically don't like too much to have too much pressure and there is more space because if you want you know when you look at pigmatite basically uh crystal to grow needs space if they don't have space they cannot grow they cannot grow basically clean crystal cannot grow and then you have a pressure going up like a pro grain metamorphism and pressure going down if the thing is not going too high, if you don't have really, uh, if it's not going over pressure, you don't have too much twinning. So fine crystal will grow, you know, on the post-grade metamorphism. That's the theory I read in many uh, geology yeah. books. Yes. But, but the impact of the pegmatite in the area on a ruby and sapphire, I think that uh, from field observation, it's all the time striking me, oh, in this place, oh, there are granitic dome and you have a ruby deposit and the rubies are good. Why well, I'm not surprised. I will, sh I will show you, take a few seconds, I will show you an example. Mm. Oh. I, did, I did not prepare, but I will show you a geological map. I'll see if you see it. This is the original, the, the mining company in the Euros gave it to me. So here is a granite intrusion, pink one. So. Yeah. You have some pegmatites, red spot here. Here is pegmatitic. You have granite sticking up outside because the granite is dipping under. So what you have here is gem pegmatized this direction. Uh, here you have amethyst, but these are 300 million years old. Amethyst veins, 212 million years old. In the contact, here you have emerald deposits all along the contact. The big emerald mines are down here. 
What you have here, green square, you have emeralds, elixirite, you have even sapphires together with the, you know, with the emeralds. Mm -hmm. Very, very small. But then here, I would say the zone here right next to the pegmatites, this is good quality corundum in this area. So right by the stream in Alabashka, you can find nice spinels and corundum even in the marble. There is a small outcrop with marble. And in the streams, you can find gem corundum. Mm -hmm. So it is certain. Here, it is north-south, one mountain chain. So very easy to see the sonation. You can, so if you have a, the Russians or from, even from Soviet time, they did very good ge geological studies with drilling and very good descriptions. Of course, they didn't always describe everything that we see today, but they made very, very detailed studies and corundum log, log down here is one big uh, cor corundum deposit. So it's just to confirm what you're saying. And of course, I've studied you know, many places, like you said, Mogok, there are many places where you do have this, uh, and I see it as uh, the right, not too high pressure, but the right conditions, and many times it's a really crystallization. Mm -hmm. So often when you have a, a first crystallization, you get rough, big crystals, not so high quality. And most places are like that. But when you have a recrystallization, temperature a little lower, and you get usually much higher quality crystals. So if you look in a region of metamorphic rock, you need to find, and that area of recrystallization, it could be just a few decimeters. You may have an area which is hundreds of meters or kilometers, and it could be a very, very narrow band where exactly the temperature was, correct, was right and not too big disturbances during the formation, where you have the really, really high quality. And of course, it's not always the miners. They notice, okay, here we found one quality one here, but it's not always they have this, and it's not so easy to see because it's three-dimensional. So... Under the marbles, you have granites going, you have pegmatite dikes, even cookie lau spinel deposit. There, when I visited, I could see uh, some pegmatites running through the whole deposit. Mm -hmm. So I have not seen this described, oh, but I know there was secondary higher quality there, you know. This is a discussion that we had uh, when uh, I took to uh, Mogok uh, a few years ago, I took uh, Gaston Giuliani and uh, Aaron Palki. Aaron Balki now is at GA. He was at GA at the beginning, at this time already. He was one of my colleagues. And I took them there to uh, visit uh, Dato, which, which is a, a ruby mine on, uh, on the eastern side of Mokok, not very far from one of these granitic intrusions. There is a granitic intrusion just at the back of Dato. Yeah. And Dato is a place where I was, it's, all, it's probably the most famous mine in Mogok, a ruby mine in Mogok, because this is the place where the stone has the better crystal. The, the, the ruby crystal are super transparent, highly transparent. Sometimes they don't have the right color, they are slightly pink. But when they get, for example, 10 or 20 carats, you know, uh, a, a stone that is pinkish at one carat, at 20 carat, when you cut, you know, Justin, you know that, when you cut a, a large stone, you will get a perfect red stone, bright red stone, 20 carat, because uh, and the quality of the crystallization is incredible, but everything is well crystallized. The appetite is well crystallized. The marble is, actually it's not marble, you are mining them in calcite. So everything, not just the ruby are well crystallized, but everything around is well crystallized. So we were wondering uh, why, you know, in, in some place in Mogok, you have a kind of sugary, uh, marble that is not very transparent. And most of the time, the rubies are not very transparent either. But in some other place, everything is transparent. You take a torchlight, you put it on the marble, you can see 20 centimeters inside the marble with a torchlight, and this is that all. So, you know, going to a visit place in Mogok and then in Vietnam and, you know, all, all around, I, I was not too much in uh, pegmatite, and I was on ruby and sapphire, but I started to get a very uh, much uh, stronger interest in pegmatite because I see that uh, most of the time, one of the maybe gem quality factor is the presence of uh, intrusion. Uh, pegmatite. Most people say that rubies are metamorphic, 
But the more I'm studying, um, the more I'm visiting a ruby mine, the more I'm uh, thinking that, uh, well, there is a, at least a metasomatic kind of uh, probably a compound or at least, uh, you know, something that is, you know, me pure metamorphism doesn't explain the quality factor. No, because, you know, as I said, looking at the pegmatites, I started with euros, I've looked at many, many, many places. We just look at the structure. Same with metamorphic marble deposit. You look at the structure. When you can see the structure, here is getting really good. And you can look at, you don't need to see the ruby, you look at the other minerals, like you say, the calcite. This is well crystallized. If there's mica, jammy mica, you can see it on the other minerals, what the conditions were. So you understand that from looking now. Sometimes pegmatites is not any transparent at all. It's just feldspar, but it's the shape of the feldspar, the shape of the, uh, the mica, the size, grain size. So it's all this. So I would say a marble deposit is in a way easier. But of course, you have mountains like Mogok and the Valley. So you need to look very, very much and try to understand where the intrusions are. And like Dutto, it's high on the, uh, high on the mountain. But you can, if you get a very, very good geological understanding, you can predict where there will be good zones. So I have looked in, in, in places like Mogo because of the vegetation. Yes, exactly. exactly. In places like Greenland, uh, because there is no, uh, tr there are no trees. But in tropical areas like uh, Madagascar or Burma, it's covered with jungle. So yes. No, it's you need to look at geological maps. So when, when I showed you this geological map from the big scale structure, you can understand. So for instance, I helped one friend in Vietnam. He was asking me specifically about some minerals. I said, okay, here's the geological map. Here, here, here is a big chance to find this mineral. Just from looking at geological map, I can, I can, it's easy. I don't know if you have this granite intrusion. I don't know the level of erosion, so I cannot tell that the best deposit of this type was higher up, or if it's further down, or if it's the erosion level today. But, you know, I can look at many granite intrusions, and you can see from where the good pegmatites are, you can understand if it's, if they're at the apex, they will be in the center of this granite intrusion. Otherwise, they will be outside, so if you have a uh, erosion level down here, you will find the good pegmatites in the ring around. So it's all the thing. Sometimes you have a very, very flat intrusion, and then they could be almost everywhere. So it, it's, it's really a lot behind everything. And then within pegmatites, if it veins or if it's chamber, I would say even in a pegmatite, each one is unique. You must look very carefully in each one and understand. So when I've, I've been to about 3,000 mines and quarries, but of course, I've seen many, many more pegmatite veins. I don't even know how many thousand because one area you can have seven, eight hundred pegmatite veins that you see within a few days. So, but I've been to about three thousand mines and quarries that I've studied. So it's about one, one per week of my life, one new place. But of course, one week you go and see many, many places, and during one day you can see twenty quarries where there are many near each other, in different zone, different uh, mineral mineralogy. But, but uh, it's very important to look at the structure and uh, for sure this with the so-called metamorphic deposits, it's heavily influenced by the granites and sometimes also the pegmatites and the heat flow. And then if you speak metasomatism, of course you also have, have uh, fluids. They don't need to be uh, fluids directly. They don't always need to be involved in the mineral formation because even if you just have the exactly right temperature from a granite intrusion, a certain distance, so you have a gradient, and if it's a kept for a good time, depending on how big the intrusion is, you will have zones around where it's ideal. Now, of course, depending on if the right ingredients is in this area, if there is corundum at that, perhaps there isn't corundum, it's a bit further away where it's, uh, you know, depends on the formation, but of course it needs to be studied very, very carefully. And I have ideas how one should, should do in Mogok Valley, but this is big scale the thinking. And if I will work with that, yeah, it's, more, years, it's, I, no, it's, huge. it's uh, basically uh, more than 50 kilometers uh, east to west or north to south. Yeah. It's about uh, 10, 15, and you have a big fault. You know, north of Mogok, you have uh, Mobek and you have a fault. And uh, when you look at the geology of uh, Mogok area, it's uh, uh, 
it, it's incredible. In this place, you have, uh, you know, some uh, uh, this uh, S shape uh, marble, uh, basically arcs, uh, where you have the rubies. They are all in the same, uh, following the same layer that was bent. And then you have this uh, granitic intrusion, and then you have this fault, this major fault. And uh, it's actually it's a highly complicated area. When you look at the map, it's already complicated. But when you go and you go around uh, this uh, granitic intrusion and you are wondering about pigmentite, well, some miners told me that, you know, mining rubies actually is quite easy in, in Mogok. There is a bed that is going from there to there, and they are all mining, you know, in Afghanistan, in a, in a Jagdali. It's very simple. You follow the layer of marble, and basically you mine the marble, you find the rubies. They are all along the same former layer of salt. Yeah. Because rubies, you had, a, when you read the work by a, a Garnier with a Giuliani and things like that, and you hear the, you understand the role of evaporite in the formation of rubies from marble type. So then you can understand that how ruby were formed in a, a marine type uh, uh, environment with shallow water, and uh, you had salt and things like that, and the role of evaporite. So rubies are, are quite easy to find in marble. But when you are starting to work with pegmatite, you are going to a kind of level of craziness that is unbelievable. Most of the too many miner I met told me that, yeah, there is theory, but then every pegmatite is different. Uh, and in your area, you know, from one area to another one, it's complicated. And when you look at a single crystal of tourmaline, one of my friends told me, Vincent, what is for you the definition of tourmaline? When you look at, you know, the chemical composition of tourmaline, it starts to be long like that. And, and I was trying to remember thing. I said, well, no, no, he told me, okay, tourmaline is a trash can of the pegmatite. So everything that is remaining inside the pegmatite is going in the damn crystal. When you look at two tourmaline crystals, there is not one tourmaline crystal that is the same as the next one. And most of the time, a single tourmaline crystal, you have 20 different colors inside and the chemical composition is completely, uh, you know, uh, uh, different from one part of the tourmaline to the other one. Yeah. So when you look at the crystals that are so, uh, with, with, with so much difference inside, it's completely crazy to try to modelize you know, the, the whole condition on, in order to, to find so-called the perfect one. We saw that in Ruby and Sapphire with Sapphire because Sapphire, you have a lot of color zoning and it's making the work of people like me trying to do original determination of Sapphire very difficult because it's close to that. But for Tumalin, it looks like a, another level of uh, yeah. amazing greediness. Yeah, if you, if you look at one pegmatite, like, let's say we have a vein five meter wide, maybe a kilometer and a half long, and it's dipping down. You can mine at 50 meters, 100, 200, 300. So you need to understand where is the best source. Sometimes it's up, sometimes it's further down, sometimes it's below 100 meter level. It's very, very different. And then each vein, usually they have swallows and so on. And, and the conditions, when it crystallizes, it depends on very much. Maybe it's a split of two veins. Maybe there's a tiny side wing going out. So you have a pressure change. So you have a pocket there. You can have rocks from the surrounding falling into the pegmatite and you have rapid crystallization. It depends on the temperature. If you have a very, very um, sharp contact, then if a rock is falling down, you have fast crystallization. So that now I'm just mentioning a few. But there are hundreds of signs and leads too. So sometimes I've seen geological maps. So I had one geologist working one mine now. I asked him, what's the key to this pegmatite? I know what the key is, but I'm asking, what's the key to the pegmatite? To this one, and only to this one. There is a key. I know the key to this one pegmatite, but I'm asking him because he needs to understand it, you know. <laughs> so, so each one, when you see each one, like I said, each one is unique. And there are many, many, many components that creates, so you have one pocket of tourmaline, completely different colors, different morphology than the next one. But usually mm -hmm. within each pocket, you have several generations, typically minimum two generations, three, sometimes even four generations. So you also need to understand this. And if you have a pocket of, um, let's say aquamarine, 
in Pakistan or in Brazil. In Brazil, it's often so weathered that you cannot see it so so well, but some are. You have a pocket like this. Down here, miners are coming in. They're completely etched, poor color, completely eaten up. Then you go a little higher up, not so etched, some etching disappears. Here you have a crystal where the bottom half is etched, the rest is not. Then you have from the roof, some long, big, blue, blue, perfect crystallization aquas. Small crystals, almost colorless, some blue. So within a pocket, you can have, I have made pictures from complete pocket contents. I know where it's crystallized, where, just for documentation so I can show other people and teach, you know. So in the same pigmentite, in the same pocket, you have different pocket. pieces. Completely different within the pocket. You can even have an aquamarine here, going to morganite over here. This very area, you can have green barrels, you can have heliodor here, and then you have one blue-green aquamarine. So sometimes if you have a big several meter pocket, there are just the gem crystals in one little corner here. Same in, you know, I studied many ore deposits also, sometimes in ore deposits, that's why it's important to study many different types and look at crystallization sequence. So ore deposits, I found one tunnel that the miners, when I came there, they thought, oh, this is an old uh, mine tunnel from some centuries ago. No, it is not. This ore body was only known by drilling several hundred meter depth. So they went into two different levels, but it looked like a perfectly old time round and mine tunnel. I took a huge ladder, climbed up to it, crawled in, and it was pure magnetite, but it was like a chimney effect. So solutions had gone up, small appetites had crystallized in the tunnel, 10 meter up, it was splitting. There were huge Hedenbergite crystals. So the change of conditions were, and the mineralization, but it's very important to study many, many different types of deposits, the structure of the rock, the structure of pockets, uh, the minerals itself, and the variety of crystallization of each mineral. <coughs> so, because it all comes down to the real conditions. And we always think about minerality when it comes to pigment, what was the chemistry? Yes. But it's also the physics of the pegmatite very important for the crystallization. When you know we suffer with the ruby and sapphire, the closest with pigmatite, of course, are you know blue sapphire mine. <coughs> so yes. I was, able, I was not able to go to uh, visit the mine in Kashmir, but uh, I read several articles about the sapphire deposit in Kashmir, and uh, you know it seems that the sapphire were found in pocket. And uh, some pocket uh, sapphire crystal are like that, and some pocket the sapphire crystal are like this. Yes. And uh, basically, sorry, basically uh, the interesting thing is that later I went to uh, Madagascar in Andromeda, and I went also to Kataragama in uh, Sri Lanka, where you know sapphire are found in a very similar condition because the interesting thing with this deposit is that most of the sapphire deposits around the world are found like a secondary deposit, but sometimes there are some primary deposits like Andron on Dom or like uh, Kataragama. In Kataragama, people still think that it's not a real deposit that they found a gemstone in a kind of, uh, they found a treasure from a king, but actually it's uh, from the description of the guy who were working there, it seems much more like a, a deposit, a pocket type a primary deposit. And when I visited the deposit in Andromedam, I, I met a local geologist who uh, mined uh, for an Austrian company working there. And he mined uh, more than uh, 200 pockets. And, uh, and he told me about the same thing as the guy who was driving a machine in uh, Kataragama, that uh, every time they open a pocket, nine pockets out of 10, bogus pocket, nothing inside, in Qatar, they don't call that pocket. When I was speaking about pocket, the guy was not understanding. But as soon as he, we put the word pumpkin, they call that pumpkin. Then he understood everything and he started to describe, you know, oh, when you open the pumpkin, then there is a layer like that. And then there is a layer like that. And then you find sapphire. It seems that for sapphire, when you open, open this pocket of pumpkin, uh, in one pocket of pumpkin, most of the stones are very similar. So you have a pocket with maybe 40 big crystal or a pocket with maybe 1000 small ones that are all etch or all milky. But actually it seems that at least for sapphire, when you open these pockets that are, you know, usually not as big as what you say, but they are about maximum few meter size. I met a guy in 
on journal and arm will find 250 kilograms of sapphire in one pocket. Um, milky one, not really great quality, but uh, okay. But it seems that from one pocket to another one, the stones are different, which, you know, on the original termination point of view, start to be a kind of worrying. How can you be sure that if you take a stone, few stones, you know, from one pocket, that this stone will be representative from the big stone found in the next pocket? Probably it's not, because from one pocket to another one, the stones are different. So how can we do origin determination yes. on stones that are coming from pocket? For sapphire, it seems that this is highly complicated, probably because of uh, this thing. And for tourmaline, even if there are so many uh, trace elements inside tourmaline, uh, I don't know, but it seems that this is highly complicated. Uh, it, it is complicated, but you also you need to, you know, with the trace element is helping us a lot. So if you if you plot, you know, two specific ones, you can plot from different deposits and get to regions. So even if you think of tourmaline for paribatite tourmaline trace element chemistry is quite useful to identify the origin because currently there are three deposits. But when there will be one day, maybe 10 or 20, I don't know. Yeah. But for three, it's like for ruby and sapphire. When you have three deposits, it's kind of okay. When you start to have more, yeah, of course, because they're overlapping in some areas. So, so those specific stones, you can't really tell. You could guess, but in fact, you know, uh, from geological, mineralogical viewpoint, we always keep a label, simple paper label. Note yeah. where it is, where it was collected, or if you get it from a miner or a mineral dealer, you have a label with it. So when it comes to gemstones, which are more precious, I have pieces of granite that is worth zero. They have no value without the information. With the information, they have a scientific value. So it's strange that they don't keep. I know for gem dealers, they don't want to say where they came. They even say, this is from this is from Sri Lanka, it's from Mozambique, or they would tell anything, you know, to, because there's so many people who would jump on and fly, take the next flight to try to go behind their back and all this kind of, I don't have to deal with such people mm -hmm. not involved in this type of business or deposits. But um, when you when you when you access, it's not because you access, for example, the mine and you you collect sample and you're able, you know, uh, basically a field geology, it's about traceability. It's uh, yes. because lab were cheated by uh, people who are providing sample people, you know, as uh, some people say, you know, miners are in many places of the world, they are very vulnerable because they are, you know, they have a lease or they, they work a place. And if people know that uh, there is something valuable in that place, you know, you might, uh, somebody more powerful might come or even your family will ask for money or something like that. So miners are vulnerable and they don't want all the time to say that they found uh, the place where they found something that is valuable. And I can understand that. Of and then they, of course, don't want to lead their uh, competitors to their supplier. So dealers tell stories and sometimes because they have commercial interests so they are willing to tell you this story or that story. So actually many labs found themselves in a situation where, you know, some of the stones in their collection that they get for maybe a hundred years were heated because there was heat treatment uh, for 1000 years and it was not labeled. So the fact that some stone are heated, even if, uh, you know, you have a stone for 500 years in a, in a, in a safe in a museum, maybe that stone was heated 520 years ago in Sri Lanka because there was heat treatment in Sri Lanka for more than 1,000 years. So there are many samples that cannot be used as a reference for lab. So that's why some lab decided to uh, use the service of people like me to go to the field to collect some samples in order to provide some traceability to the sample and be sure that these samples are actually coming from the place where they are supposed to come and basically were not heated. Yeah. But even, okay, when, when you get to that point and you get a stone from a from place, a traceable sample that uh, at least were coming from the village or from the mine, even if you witness the mining, in some case, in the case of blue sapphire, uh, to find a, a technique to be able to separate um, stone from uh, different areas is difficult because I think uh, of uh, this uh, geological setting 
especially associated with uh, pigmentite or metasomatism when you have fluid on the formation of this pocket, that uh, basically, as you say, if every pigmentite is unique or every pocket is unique, it's much more complicated than when you deal with, for example, rubies that are found that are more metamorphic than metasomatic and where you know you have a, a greater uniformity in uh, in the deposit yeah, while one soul and a pegmatite it is a vein with many different zones so vertically in the vein mm -hmm. from each pocket within the long vein one and a half kilometer maybe there's a few hundred meters that carry this gel and mm -hmm. vertically there are different zones with different fractionations so of course you have a fractionation in such a vein so most i would say like you say this will be deposit there are Maybe you don't need to return as many times, but some pegmatite deposits that I studied, I studied, for instance, from 1985 to 1995, it took me 10 years to get permission to be the first one ever non-Soviet to enter one uh, pit supports mine in Ukraine. And I've studied it since 1995, so I go dozens of time, and there are 1,900 pegmatized mines. So, of course, I go and study as many hundred as I can. Every time they pumped out to uh, one shaft, I go, and there Hundred, hundred pegmatites. We search as many as possible. Most have only cores, nothing else. But everyone is unique. And I look at the structure, the shape of the pegmatite itself, the shape of the cavity, even the quartz crystals, morphology. Really, all minerals you you look at and study. So you have a, you know, it's there. It's it's a huge uh, diff difference. Some people say, oh, this is this type, this, this type, yeah, but we all try to simplify. It's really so much, so much more. And, and when we spoke about, you know, metamorphic deposits, the granite intrusion, pegmatized, there's not only just the granite intrusion. Within the granite is a segregation. Maybe you even have three, four different rocks. Maybe you have several impulses. Maybe you had seven, nine, ten impulses of this granite or igneous rock. So you can age date and you or look at the geochemistry and see the differences and even from structural. And, and so you could have several impulses of pegmatites. For instance, the Himalayas are forming now. So we have age data pegmatites, eight till 23 million years old. What about those that are forming right now? Because they're mm -hmm. still forming. So if you win 300 million years time, well, age data is, oh, they're 300, maybe there were two or three generations. Yeah. Maybe there were 100 generations re in reality. You know? <laughs> In the same area, like uh, I was looking at, uh, you know, uh, visiting the KJ Mineral Mine in Zambia. Yes. And they, they, they dig this whole beautiful place. So you can go on your other side, on the, standing in front of the mine, and you can see the wall, and you can see all the pigmatite, you know, crossing uh, the different layers. And I was wondering, uh, sometimes you have one pigmatite like that, and then you have another one crossing. And I say, do they have the same age, all these pigmatites? And they say, no. Ah, OK. <laughs> so right. you have some pigmatites like that, some pigmatites that were, you know, that were crossing horizontal. Yes. And, uh, and uh, basically, they, are, they were looking at emerald you know, at the junction because of the, uh, actually, in that case, it was quite easy because for them, emerald were forming in the reaction zone between a rock that, was, that is rich in chromium and a pigmatite that is bringing so basically you you look at the rocks that are rich in chromium and you are looking at where these rocks are intruded by pigmatite and then you have a reaction zone and then in the reaction zone you have the emerald yes. so actually it's not that complicated but still they don't find the same quality of emerald everywhere so there is a still oh in this place we found this and that so even in something where the model looks quite simple actually when you get in practice it's funny because you see such a, a, a huge wall and the the area where you will find the stone is uh, sometime maybe five or six centimeter wide yes exactly <laughs> and, and, and and the pit is one kilometer by one kilometer to mine a place that is six centimeter wide and why it's so important to be in the field a lot because even when I started not so, uh, what should we say, exotic and valuable material, when I was a child looking, I found small fishes. But even if you found one fisher 50, 100 meters long, there was just maybe one spot it crystallized, pyrite crystals or epidote or something. 
but you learn a lot studying all kinds of not so exotic deposits. You learn a lot from the from the crystallizations and, and how often and where where things occur. Do you guys want to do um, a few questions? Because there's a few that have been hanging out. Maybe right. it'll be fun. Sorry, keep people waiting. Just to switch it up a little bit. Yes. Um, so going back to when you were speaking about your childhood in Sweden, somebody had asked, could you recommend a few places to visit? Like if someone was going to visit Sweden for... Sweden. Yes, there, there are different uh, types. When it, <clears throat> when it comes to pegmatites, there are many regions. It's southern Sweden. It's both the west coast, the east coast, up in the north. So in fact, the best is to get a geological book, the descriptions, geological uh, books. Uh, SGU, the Swedish Ge Geological Survey, have good maps you can find online and usually the description for each region. So there's some places you're not allowed to collect, but historically, the lithium pegmatite of Ute, so outside Stockholm. So you can take a boat out there, beautiful island, you can see the dams. Now you don't see much pegmatite, it's just coming up uh, above the water level, one of the open pit, but it was an iron mine where two big pegmatites were going crossing the iron ore. So it has been mined since, since 14, 1500 or something. They mined silver, I think, on the other since 1100. But this pegmatite goes down to 214 meter depth. So you have a thin vein. I think it's a couple of meters at the widest, one and a half meter. But you have the discovery of lithium pegmatite. It was there. Discover of lithium, element lithium. Discover of spodium. Discover of indigo blue tourmaline. Indigo light in Swedish. But Andrada misspelled it. I've said it on numerous... Uh, lectures the last 20 years, you know, but it's still indigo blue terminal, indigo light, and there is really indigo blue Uta. Mm. Uh, so there is a good place. Just north of Stockholm is Pytteby. So there we discovered the rare earth element pegmatites for the first time in the world. So two completely different types of pegmatites right around a capital in Europe, which is fantastic. Their first known specimen dates from 1756 from Uteby. So from the uh, name of the village, Ut Uterby, is Uterbium. Then Utrium, then they took away the Y, Terbium, took away the T, Erbium, Scandium, Holmium from Stockholm and so on. So in Sweden was the greatest number of elements discovered because of the mines. So now we spoke about the pegmatites, but then the Bergslag and iron ore district is in central from Stockholm straight west. And there are about 2000 iron mines, many polymetallic veins also, some are working. And what is nice is that there are dumps in the forest. So you need to get some geological literature. The best is, I would say, is due because there are a list of the books, of the publications of maps that one can, and some one, one can even find online some, some maps. So that's the best start. Okay. I, I think that I, I read somewhere that the first spinel, the first spinel, the first blue spinel ever yes. described. Yeah, it's also the south of Stockholm. Yeah. Wow. Yes. In uh, the 70s or something. So the first publication about spinel was actually a blue spinel, yes. and it was found in uh, Sweden. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And Peter, can you recommend some books for people on pegmatites? Well, there are quite many. Uh, let's see, I, I have here, this is all about pegmatites right here. This is all about pegmatites. And then I have many meters of special publications. So, these first ones are in Russian on pegmatite, which most people don't read in English. Uh, you would go to Canadian mineralogists. They have several special publications on pegmatites. So we can mean Canadian mineralogists. Then you have... That's, that's a journal? Canadian yes. mineralogists? Okay. Mineral, it's a mineralogical journal. So they look like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Take a screenshot for those so yeah, that's very good. This is, of course, the Quintos mine with Paraiba Termaline. And uh, put this there. Then there are many, uh, the mineralogical record. Let's see what I have here. I will see. Let's see here. This is uh, the Russian Volodarsk Volinsk. So I would say. Look at the lock. This is German magazine, Mineralian Belt, and the mineralogical record in English and the Russian, and Les Reines Mineraux in French. There are special issues on pegmatite deposits. So if you're especially interested in 
in gem pegmatites. I would say if you want to, like Vincent to make a really jump start, you get those because you know to get the knowledge to write this book, you need to study 20, 30 years. So if you read this number of times and study carefully, you will really uh, learn a lot. I will show you a few more here. Uh, let's see. Here is mineralogical record. Here is an article uh, on Volodars that I wrote in this one. Uh, there is one I wrote on uh, Afghan pegmatites. There is one recent one also, uh, Extra Lapis, uh, which is published. Let's see, we have here. Well, this is a record. This is on Malchansk, thermal in pegmatites in France by Karl Russia. So if you get the special publication, and of course, Emerald and other barrels, it's if you come to pegmatize, that's uh, something you definitely should have. Here is a book about pegmatology, yeah. which is giving uh, much of the basics. It does not have much about pocket formation and jam, but it has some. So I think uh, I spoke with Skip Simmons and I think I will maybe help them write a couple of chapters about gem pegmatites and put about the pocket formation would be very good to update this and would be. I think for people, if people want to have a crash course in pegmatite, I think recently there was a guy who gave a very interesting webinar as a guest for AIGS. Ah, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's, that's a very fast crash course. In fact, when I gave that one, I was thinking to make I could make maybe 10, 20 different levels of the same. This was very overview for gemologists. I could go second level, third, and when you come to level 10 or 15 or 20, it will be valuable for whether you're a gemologist or geologist or mineralogist. And I, I could do such courses easily. It's just that if you want to make explain many things, you need to uh, do a lot of drawings, which takes a lot of time. And I can do by hand drawings and and take a picture and put in a PowerPoint. That's easy. I did that at GIA. I, I gave a talk, and in fact, I aimed it not only at gemology. It was maybe too much geology because I spoke in a 2011 conference. So mm -hmm. I gave a talk. There were 700 people in the audience, and I got very, very nice feedback. Although it was a technical, some parts I cut down because I noticed people was not really <laughs> understanding everything of it. But there I gave a spectrum of the types of pegmatites from the granite intrusion. And I think I will prepare some PowerPoints in the future. So I will have 10, 20, which goes down to different levels. Because I know even among researchers, I am one of the few percent who I think I have seen the biggest variety of pegmatites in many areas of the world. So I, I think many people could benefit from it. From what I heard, yeah, you are probably the one. Huh? <laughs> I, don't about that, but I don't think that there is many people alive or even uh, dead who have visited so many pegmatites and yours, at least in all different countries, because yeah, it was hard to travel. You, know. you, you went, of course, to Sweden and then you went to Russia, you went to Ukraine, you went to Brazil, you went to Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, you uh, went to uh, Namibia. Yeah, Namibia, Madagascar, but you know, even you know, I've studied pegmatites even in Morocco, in different places. I've and crystallizations in granites, other places. I've traveled, and this is my holiday. I go to one area, and of course, I select. I have many areas left. This is your holiday. So, so you don't have anybody to finance that. And, and like most of the time, I'm not going if to the, of the audience will finance. I'll be happy for a very. Yeah. When, when I'm going to the field, usually, you know, at the beginning, I was doing on my own, on my holiday. And then I found a AIGS and Googling to a finance ad, then a GA, then a little bit of Danat. And now it's back, you know, uh, basically on my own and I find my expedition. But what I find amazing with you is that for the past basically 50 years, you are financing all that by yourself. Basically, this is your passion. You have a, a, a work that you know, basically you make money with something else and you are using your, during your holidays, you are uh, on your own, on your passion, you are going to visit pegmatite around the world. And, and, and you became the world best expert on pegmatite. Well, I'm, I'm one of those who are, have the deepest interest. I think when, 
when I was a student, I was teaching geology, minerality, and some geology at university while I was a student at university. And then also one friend who had studied with me became teacher of physics and mathematics. And then she was ill for a couple of weeks. She knows she asked me if I could take, take her courses, and I did. And the first lecture I, I gave to the student was switch off the light, I showed slides, and everybody, all the kids, wow, how nice mathematics, they sit back. And then after 20 minutes, I switch on the light and I told them, okay, people ask me, how can you afford to travel? What do you think my answer is? Oh, you, you inherited money, you won the lottery, you make so much money. And I was, you know, I was a student and I was not making much money. I said, no, how can, my answer is, how can you afford not to travel? And they, what? I said, okay, put here week, month, year. You're 20 year old, you move out from home. What do you spend money on? And of course, every day, I didn't write now, day, okay, you're 20 years old, one package of cigarettes, weak candy, you go to the discotheque, you drink, the satellite channels on TV per month. So you calculate this. I guarantee you just do this. And it's not that you cannot spend this money, but it's about priority. You will spend two to four thousand euro dollar every year on such things. This journal here, Evening Post, with no only blah blah, which is nonsense uh, news, which is half is fake, if not even more, you know. So I did this for my students. They all did this, they summed up, and I didn't give them homework, but I got so nice feedback from the parents because they came home and said, Dad, how much does the wine bottle cost? Mom, you smoke, how much is the package of cigarettes? And they made a summary and they told their parents, we can go on holiday. We can, if you don't do this and that, and let's skip those satellite channels, we can go on holiday once a time. And I said, you don't need to skip this two to 4,000. You skip half of it, you prioritize, okay, I go two times to discotheque this week. And then I don't go for a month. And when I was young, I told my, 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 my friends, some were older than I, I said, Okay, I bought this mineral. It was 100 Swedish crowns, 10 euro. And you think it's too expensive. Yes, it's too expensive. Okay, what did you do? Yesterday, you had a pizza and a beer. How much was that? Oh, 95. Yeah, 95. Really? Where is it now? Out already. You're kidding me. I got this rock here still, you know. So most I spent on traveling, but it's really is all about priorities. So when I was a young student, I couldn't afford to buy the books. Many good books have come lately, but I, there was no way in the world I could afford to buy the books that I need and university didn't have. So, of course, when we make more money, the older we become, we can get some books, which is expensive. It is not expensive for what it is, because I'd rather pay some 100 euro, 200 euro for a really good book than buy rubbish where there's no information. So, if you want to make shortcuts, I think you should subscribe to Gems and Gemology, the Mineralogical Record, to a couple of journals. This is, it's not expensive the year to do that. But now, it's if you get down to many of, many by the of issues. Issues. Many but, of the journals now you can get for free on internet. Exactly, many you can get for free. So now it's even, even more fantastic. I had Lapidary journals since 1972, and I couldn't keep them because I don't have so big house. It's very expensive in Luxembourg. I had to give some of them up. In fact, I kept some very special issues, but I just could not keep them all. I had National Geographic from, was 1947 or something I had. Mm -hmm. I also just gave them away because I, I, I don't have space for that. I have to prioritize to the to keep. But really, uh, when, when I was a student, I went to the USA for a three month study tour. I had 1200 US dollar to travel three months, but I had already bought one airline ticket to come to New York. I had bought five internal tickets and I bought 10 24-hour bus tickets and I slept in the desert I slept with some friends I gave some talks and I traveled 23 states and I shipped back 1,600 kilo minerals of course freight collect because I had, didn't have money barely for food but when I got back I worked all summer when the minerals arrived I had all my summer money just to pay for shipping you know but it was all self-collected 1,600 kilo 3,000 pounds of rocks and I gave it all away after when I studied it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I perfectly understand the thing. And when sometimes I, I listen to the complaint of some of the people willing to come with me and telling me that they don't have the money for this and they don't have the money for that. 
and when I see them coming with a brain closed and things like that, right. you come on. And then, and then hmm, yeah. yep, obviously, priorities. obviously, priorities or setting of the priorities were not exactly the same. Oh. And uh, yeah, no, I, I found many people, you know, they are not coming, uh, you know, from a wealthy family, but you know, like uh, uh, for me at the beginning, uh. I wanted to do something, so I was planning, uh, okay, I need that, so I need to work for one year. And before, before to go to gemology, I was planning my, uh, my shift, you know, when I found the book Ruby and Sapphire, and I was sitting, okay, how can I go to gemology and things like that? It took me three years to save the money to be able to go on uh, learning gemology in Burma, and then learning gemology, uh, studying gemology at AIGS, uh, at, uh, at GIA, and then working at the IGF for a while, what I was losing money every month because my salary was not covering my uh, uh, the the cost of living, uh, you know, in uh, in Silo. Uh, it took me uh, basically the first eight years in gemology. I lost money every month, and uh, after eight years, I was able to break even, and to break even and to reach basically the level of the saving I was doing when I was tour leader. So it, it took me eight years to get in a, in a basically profitable level. And, and I, I had several students like you were uh, telling me that, hmm, well, gemology is a, is a very nice passion, but as a business, it's a very complicated to, uh, to make a living out of gemology. And uh, that's true. So sometimes you have to go outside of gemology to find, uh, you know, to make some money and then save the money so you can follow your passion. Exactly. And this is exactly the kind of thing I'm thinking now these days with the COVID-19, where suddenly I my know. business model based on traveling is dead because I cannot go out from the country. Yeah, so <laughs> I have a pennies now. But you know, I, I was working, uh, when I was student at university, I was teaching at university, but then I had evening classes in geology, mineralogy, and some gemology. I even showed them how to facet. I built a machine when I was 18. But uh, I I worked Monday night. Tuesday night giving lectures after university. Wednesday night sometimes we went to a factory where we produce C vitamin and selenium tablets. We just filled the machines. Weekend I worked also. So sometimes I worked as a tour guide to ski resort. I had no money to, to, to pay for skiing. I couldn't afford it from when I was in the army. So I got paid 150 euro to go a ski trip to Norwegian mountain, bring the people, guide them in the mountain, arrange picnics and things. But I didn't have to pay, pay the four or five hundred euros to ski, so I got paid for it. And I did that during many years when I was in the army, when I was a student, and I had simultaneously several works. I remember one summer where I worked at a construction site every daytime. So this, this was work from seven till five. And then I biked and I worked at Volvo Car Company evenings. That was six till six in the morning. So I slept during the lunch hour and I slept 45 minutes in the middle of the night and biked 10, 12 kilometers back and forth. But I did that during two weeks overlapping, but I made the money so I could go to some geological expedition, but I was really exhausted after that, so I don't recommend that. Better to work a few, few nights a week, but it's not, not so easy. There were not so many, uh, most of the people uh, that uh, you know I travel with were not exactly at that level of uh, commitment. I have to say. Have to, I mean, it, I it, one or two. There were one or two who were really, uh, working hard in order to, because I don't pay plane ticket and I don't pay travel expense of the people traveling with me. Um, every time I did, it was a mistake because basically the people who did the less were the people that uh, I pay their travel expense. And these people were the, probably the, the they, were, they were not really, they were the worst at preparing the expedition and the results were usually uh, very bad. So I, I, I learned that, you know, if you want somebody motivated in an expedition, you make sure that he cover all his costs. If he is motivated, if he's motivated enough, you know, to save the money, then this guy will uh, really uh, do his best during the expedition and even after the expedition, because the expedition costs him and then he will value everything about it. Now, if you provide uh, this guy, you know, some, uh, you, you help the guy and you provide him this thing, 
most of the time I, I was not able to, uh, to to find any good result on investment. No, so. no, it's it's commitment, and you know the thing is there, there are no shortcuts. Everything comes after hard work. It is if you find something, what you learn. So, for instance, when I went to the Euros the first time, I had very little money. Even the airline ticket was rather expensive. I come to the middle of the Euros and I needed to get local permission even to go to Nishni Tagil, to go to Pegmatite area, to go to the Emerald Mines. And the local security office, I had to wait outside in the car while a friend went in. I spoke four words in Russia. And it took two weeks to get permission to visit the Emerald Mine. I didn't know it was a top secret military mine for Brilliant. It wasn't for Emerald, but you know, what did we know in the West? So we didn't really know what was going on there. But uh, you know, I, I bought some things there, some specimens I collected. And even when I came to the mining company, who had had 300 different mines in Euros for gemstones, some they didn't really mind a prospect, but it was the one big prospecting company in the Euros for gemstones. When I came there, they didn't tell that any mines were open, not at all. They didn't uh, give any problem whatsoever. Only after a full day speaking with geologists, looking at geological maps, he only spoke Russian. I speak a few languages, but I didn't speak much Russian. So I made sketches and I was asking and we looked at specimens. And after one full day, he said, "One, we have one pegmatite one. The last one still open. Tomorrow we'll go there." And the following day, we went to Amethyst Mine, and then we went back to the pegmatite mine. And then I came back several more times and followed the mining, you know. But they were just beginning to do the shaft, and they they hadn't uh, mined so much yet. But it was only because, even though I didn't know the language, we know both geology, so. This was one of the pieces they found. Mm. Mm. This is green, but in the daylight, it's blue, really blue, blue green. So it was found in one pocket that I mentioned with the green and yellow crystal. So, so it always comes down to you know personal contact and you know expect the unexpected, as you say. But I I don't have expectations. Never you know people with too big expectations they will be disappointed. I just have aim. If I didn't see any mine the first time I even heard there was a mine open, I would go back, I would go back, I would go back and go different ways. I'm not, uh, as a person, I'm not pushy. I don't like to push people. I speak with them. If they don't want to let me in the mine, what can I do? You know, I don't do any dirty tricks. I don't do anything. I, I wait till I meet the right person. But as you know, it takes a long time. For instance, early 90s, I made contacts to go to Amir, Tajikistan. Mm. I got to know the chief geologist, the one finding most of the past, explore, exploring. Then he moved back to Moscow. Then I got to know a Tajik man. Then finally I got to know Miner. But this is years and years of networking. And if you are genuine friends, then you, you, know, you, you bring people and so on. I had so many people wanting to come with me many places, but most times I went alone. The reason difference from you, you go to places where there is high value and it's dangerous, many places in Africa. So you need to be several for safety. I usually go in the middle of nowhere. I have nothing. I have no weapons. I have nothing. I don't have money. I don't need to bring money. I have a hammer and I have a paper and pen and I'm just ready to speak with the people. I'm ready to sleep in the mine or on the dump or in the forest or, you know, or on the mountain, 5,000 meters in Pakistan or South America. So I don't have big expectations. I think the key thing, you know, we both like people. It's re if you don't like people, you cannot do this. And you always have to listen to the people where you come. You meet a poor farmer somewhere in the mountains or, or a miner, and you need to look at the world from their perspective. You know, why should they bring me here? Why should they show you? you need, if you're not a human being and you don't have a contact, there's no way in the world they're going to bring you. And in the 90s, this was a problem in Russia. If you don't do the sauna and drink vodka there's no way in the world you're going to get into that mind so when i've been a couple of times one american friend is professor mineral he asked me peter could i come with you to russia okay <laughs> so i arranged we traveled one month in siberia Ural mountains and down to ukraine and there was one occasion in the euros we came there and i know that this was a very good geologist but he had some funny business he had cutting and he was taking over mines from the real mining company where he had worked. He had the biggest house in the village, huge house, big guard dogs. And when I came there, 
And this was the third time I had learned enough Russian so I could hear and understand what he was saying. Immediately, he called the judge in Yekaterinburg. Okay, you come here and come with your bodyguard. So we are staying at this guy's house where we were supposed to not stay from the beginning, but it ended up there. So he was the mafia boss controlling every mining there. So what do you need to do? Well, he's very good geologist. We had a great time looking at his collection and cross sections of granites and pegmatites. He had done a fantastic job. And then it was dinner time, which was in those days very difficult to get food in Russia at all. In the 90s, it was, just, it was anarchy. The country was raped by Russian oligarchs, by foreigners. There was nothing to eat almost. And he had sausage, vodka was always available, and bread. And we toasted Nastarovia, and we drank, and we sang. And then it was time, time for Banya. I'm Swedish. I'm used to sauna. We have Sweden, Finland, Russia, and some, you know, in, in the Alps also. And my American friend, he went into the banya, and Russian tradition is you take birch and you, you put it in water and you circulate, so you really burn and then beating also. And he was really screaming for his life. He's killing, he was screaming for his life. So this geologist, Igor, he was a huge, big, tall, strong geologist. He was beating my friend who was big himself you know but he was tiny in comparison and i went in i said igor it's my turn i took now I, you need to and he was beating me and it's steaming in there now okay igor you lay down and i was beating Igor. <laughs> so so the funny thing is i and my american friend we were the only ones who were sober the next morning he didn't want us to go to the mine so we went with it with a car which was delivering bread in the village we managed to get him to take us out to the mines which is terribly poor roads. You need this huge uh, one and a half meter wheels to even reach there because they're hydrothermal amethyst veins crossing the road. So they're one meter deep clay and you can barely get, even if you put branches, it's hard, hard to cross. And when we got back in the afternoon after visiting the mines with, with my American friend, Igor and I were so, oh, you went to see the mines. It was not planned, you know, he didn't want us to go see the mining company, but we were okay because we had such a great party then. Everything was okay, but he brought the judge and the judge and bodyguard who was using his revolver all the time, swaying and telling things he had done, and you know, and and this guy who, who was uh, the judge, this was in the you know criminal times in the nineties. He could probably never be a judge today, but. His brain was like a three, four year old. He would have asked Igor to shoot this guy like, like nothing, you know? So you really have to be very, very careful going in many places. And before that, my first, second trip to Russia was much more dangerous, really much more dangerous. Mm. Peter, um, aside you, you from- look about, about that, you know, the, the, the basic, the way I'm doing sometimes for selecting people is bringing people in Vietnam. For example, we go to Vietnam, and I, it's not going to uh, such extreme things as in Russia, but some people, you know, you bring them in a mining place and they have to enjoy, uh, there is a, the miners are welcoming them with a rice alcohol and dog meat. Yeah. And I can tell you, if you don't adapt to the miner, why do you think the miner will show you any stone? Yeah. So when you start uh, lecturing the miner about you're vegetarian and the miner should become vegetarian or you not, should not drink alcohol and things like that. And basically you reject everything he's offering you and you are thinking that you will see a stone. It doesn't work like that. Oh, exactly. So, so we, this, is, this is exactly the point is basically going to the field, field geology or, you know, for pegmatite or is how much you can adapt to the local people. You cannot ask the local people to adapt to you. You have to adapt to the reality of the world. It's not what you want. It's not like, I'm not following, I'm not doing what I want most of the time. Well, I like to go to the field. I like to enjoy different culture and see the, the difference in the world, which is quite okay. When you have this kind of setting, I think you can um, succeed. But it's about adaptation skills. If you don't have adaptation skills. Yeah. So easy if you want to see pegmatite. Brazil, if you know a mine owner, you can get to see mines. Otherwise, California is the easiest country to travel to. Namibia is very easy to travel in also. Other yeah. regions, not as easy. 
Someone, Peter, somebody had asked, have you been to the pegmatite mine in Pala, California? Yes, I've been to many times. I was the first time, 1987. So of course, uh, when I was there in 1987, they said, oh, those mines, those pegmatites are finished here. And I was looking, you, in Pala, you have three mountains, three hills with many. Or you even have, I would guess, estimate like 100 on the richest one, maybe 50 and a dozen on the other hill. And you see they mine some of what they thought the richest sections. And I said, we got plenty of mines here, uh, plenty of veins still to be mined. So of course there's more. Uh, so I visited many mines and not all pegmatites are located in Palo District. There's Mesa Grande District to the south. There is even further down to Yacumba. So I've been from Riverside County all the way to Yacumba. I looked at many pegmatites. Many of them I've been many, many times. So Himalaya mine, I was in 87 the first time. I saw several other Stewart mine. I was outside Terminal and Queen mine, but I've been back many, many times. And of course, most of the mine owners are, are my really good friends. And the thing when you come to mine, if you have seen many other uh, mines, of course, you need to have the knowledge uh, and respect for mines and be very well about safety. This is number one. You can't let people in where they start to do something with rocks falling down and they can hurt themselves and others. And that the liability is a big thing. So, but uh, I have really, really good friends in, in California, Ocean View Mine and Gems of Palo, two places where anyone can visit. You have to make a reservation in advance at Ocean View Mine mm -hmm. and during the weekend they have, so you can really get material from a pocket and sift through and find your own quartz crystals. If you're lucky, you find a consite or terminal. And that's a very good start. They have a shop there, same as Gems of Palo. They have the shifting outside. You can see things, you can see the rough, you can see the cut stones. So even for gemologists to get that, what the material looks like before, for those who haven't been in the field, it's a very, very good start. Okay. And very easy to visit. Even if you're in Europe or Asia, just take a flight to Los Angeles, rent a car and drive there. So plan on a week. You can do some other sightseeing, of course, but yeah. if you visit one mine, maybe you're welcome back another time, visit your second mine. And Get some T-shirts, buy some rough, maybe buy a cut stone for your wife or for yourself. Or you know, it's it's all about uh, if you if you communicate with the people and if you have something to give to them. If you, you know, if if you can give something. So most of my minor friends, we sit all evening and discuss and you know speak about different pockets. And and this is extremely valuable. A mine owner who tells me about how this pocket was and why, and I can tell about similarities in another one or about completely different. And this is the most valuable, you know, these are evenings that can be all night. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a good starter, again, if you want to visit a mine, people who are listening to us, yes. basically, you know, if you plan about that, one month before, start to read. Absolutely. You, if you read one month before and you plan your, okay, let's read three hours per day for one month before to go there, and then start to think about, you know, after your reading, you sit down and uh, you think about it and you start to, you know, to get the right question because question will come because not everything you will read makes sense and this is normal. So then you start to have question. The most important thing, you know, in science is not to find the right answer. It's more likely to find the right question. So then this is the way you advance. And when you go to see a miner and you have read something about his area, basically you have prepared your expedition and you start to ask him a few intelligent questions, then the miner is happy. And then very quickly, you will become a friend and then he will show you more. And this is the way you, you start. Basically read, then go, ask questions, make friends, adapt and make friends. So that, I think this is a, the recipe. I see a question from uh, Martin. Maybe Justin, you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah, him? yeah. I was getting to that one. So this, th I think this one's quite interesting. You you spoke a lot about how you've just kind of randomly gone to a lot of different places to to do your explorations. And somebody had asked if you found yourself in a new place, an unexplored region, what would be your methodology to find the area with the best pegmatite? And what would be your method to find, you know, hidden pockets in the field? How would you approach it? I have been, you know, if I go far away, I study usually years in advance. So when Google Earth came, I scanned every mountain of Pakistan, 
you know, even, you know, Hindu Kush in Afghanistan to look where I think there would be pegmatite, sometimes I could find pegmatite, I compare with the geological map, mean that is very good because now you can even go to a locality and you can get the geological maps, which is fantastic. So if I come to a place where I couldn't study in advance, I always do a scan, try to look at the local geology, if there's one mine or two mines, Sometimes uh, I can find an outcrop that has something that wasn't mine. Sometimes I come into the mine. So I'll give you one example. Uh, when I was a student, I brought, uh, there was a geological site in my home city and I gave evening classes for many of them. And I arranged many weekend excursions. So I brought them to one mine they wanted, which was an old feldspar quartz. And this is famous because it has brexia with small quartz crystals. So I scanned around and there was a tiny mine near it, but a bit higher up on the hill and the forest all over growth. So I brought the group there. Okay, how do you find a pocket? I said, how do you find a pocket here? Oh, this looks really ugly. There's nothing here. Okay, what do you see in the pegmatite? And I have a second story, which is exactly the same. Oh, there's nothing. Okay, let's go down in the hole. Small vein, two meter wide, a few meter long just moss and wet and snails and oh mosquito this is now let's go up okay now look at me what do you see here here is a small tree where do you think the tree will grow if you were a tree where would you grow in a pocket of course if there is a pocket i cannot guarantee so we put this tree a small tree just to the side and dug around here is a pocket doubly terminated quartz crystals I took up and filled the box for them. I said, okay, take these and uh, you have crystals from there. But don't destroy this. That was just one example. It took me one minute. To, when I see the hole, I understand there's a big chance. So another example, this was a pegmatitic conference, a little pegmatite conference, the first one in Milan in 1987. So I gave uh, three talks there. And in one talk, I spoke about uh, meralitic pegmatites in Scandinavia. And there was one friend there who oh, he was doing his PhD, he was sat next to his PhD uh, professor. And he has lived very close to this mine, so has been there much more times than I. And he said to me, you mean those, uh, he interrupted in the middle of my talk, you mean those nice, very well-shaped uh, feldspar crystals growing in the quartz, frozen in the quartz? No, no, I'm speaking about pockets now. But there are no pockets in this pegmatite. Okay, when you walk down, there's just one little row down, and the core is like this. What do you see? Well, it's just water-filled hole, yes, water-filled hole. What's on the left side is just a cliff. They mine the pegmatite all to the wall rock. What's on the right? Just bushes and trees. Exactly, bushes and trees. What is that? Pockets. I dug under every bush and tree there. There were several pockets. So pockets, one and a half meter diameter. Scepter quartz, the only ones ever found in Sweden. Beautiful muscovite roses in the pocket of this pegmatite. But he was there, I think, five to ten times more than I, but he didn't look so. Uh, I, I am helping friends now who are in Namibia. So I, I took an airplane rent and I flew over Erongo. So I look at the geological structures. I understand where there are pockets. So I'm guiding them. I'm saying, we're just looking at Google Earth. I'm sending a screenshot. Go here. Go to this place. Dig here, 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 here. There, they're not... Uh, trees and bushes in those pockets because it's so dry arid area. But just from the structure, I can tell where there will be pretty nice pegmatites and many will be cavity pegmatites. So it all depends on the terrain, depends on what type of pegmatite, and not all pegmatites do have pockets. So most do not have pockets. Mm. What are you thinking about the techniques that enable uh, to find cavities? Well, there, there are many ways. When I was in the Himalaya in 1987, I worked with radar stations in, in the army. So radar signals penetrate crystalline rock just like air. The thing is, it depends on if you do it from above, if you have overburden, clay, if you have water, water field fractures, this will make a little bit of problem. But you, with georadar, you can see the structure. You can go and look what's 10, 20, 30 meter down. You can do that. And it depends on on how far between the, the, you know, yeah. the boots, so you, you have different, but there are other methods also. And the best thing is, in my mind, uh, when I was a young student, I wrote to a mining company. I wanted to work with a mining company to put many different methods together. This was not done at the time. Now people are doing it, but I had 
an additional idea how to do it, which I don't know has been used yet. And the mining company didn't even reply to me because I was just a student. I hadn't graduated yet. I was in my second year, I think. But they were not smart enough. They could hire me for one month for peanuts for a thousand euro, you know, <laughs> in those days. <laughs> and they were not clever to, when I write to a big mining company, they were not smart enough. And my idea was to combine many, many types and, of data to yeah. see things that you cannot see with one or two or three of these, you know, you, you need to combine a lot of data. And I was doing it in a special way that you can see much more uh, than in other ways. So. But when, when you find, for, I, I saw the Darvis uh, company who are providing, uh, at least for pegmatite, unlike for corundum, corundum is quite difficult to, there is no uh, technique to find where you might find a pocket. But as, uh, for example, for tourmaline, very often, this uh, pocket or cavities, if you find, you know, if you can find uh, cavities, well, cavities may be a, a pocket that is rich in tourmaline. Yes. Yeah. So there are, or Campbell Bridges told me also about tools where he was using in the past where he was working for the British Geological Survey that enabled to find, for example, uh, beryllium. Yes. You know, so there are some techniques that right. can be used for pegmatite in order to identify is, let's say, 20 meters under your feet, there is something that might be worth digging. Yes. I was in one place and I, it was just granite. Yeah. And I just looked at the granite and just from the structure of the granite, I told this mining company, you make a drill hole right here. I cannot say if the good pegmatite was up half a meter or if it's down, but there was no pegmatite yet. Just the structure of the granite was showing that it was getting very well crystallized. Mm -hmm. So they put the drill hole, it started 20 centimeter under the granite, started the pegmatite, 30 meter pegmatite under right there. But to most people, the granite looked the same. We went over several hills and looked close. No, there was a small spot like that in the granite that I could see on crystallization. This is near the pegmatite. I don't know how big, I cannot say if it was up or down, but it is, you know, and there was the pegmatite. But this is based on years and years of observation. So yeah. you are looking and looking, like basically we do sometimes, you know, when as a gemologist working in lab, working on a days and hours and hours and hours and days on the microscope, looking at rubies and sapphire from many different places. And then slowly and slowly, you know, your eye is getting uh, experience. And yeah. then you are getting the feelings that this and that. Sometimes you cannot really explain, but it, uh, you know, there is some things that, uh, that tell you about I think that uh, it looks interesting, you know, the, <laughs> but to be able to read basically a, a, a granitic outcrop like that took you how many years? Well, you all well, your life, the, the, yeah, your I, I, the result of 50 years of observation. But, uh, yeah, but I think if you start, doesn't matter if you're, uh, but you know, when you're adult enough, so you can, when you have a car, so you can get out more often. I took the street car and bus and so on. But let's say, I, I would say that it takes 10 years to become, and very hard studies and blood field, to become reasonable and to think that you start to understand something. After 20 years of hard study, you understand that you know nothing. When you come to the level, when you realize that you know nothing, that's when you really start to learn. That's when you really start to know something. So I, I was in probably 18, 20 years old, you know, because I started very early. When I realized I know nothing, and I was probably the one on my street who knew most about pegmatites in my home city, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, I, I had I had about the same thing when I when I started with uh, going to the field in the early two thousand until you know uh, my uh, then I had GIS and then Googling, and then I started to work at GIA and uh, then suddenly John Emmett came. And he had his, uh, you know, vision of uh, gemology and a kind of a much more scientific uh, than uh, everything I ever saw before. And he started to uh, tell me uh, to take the time. You know, I really appreciated that to look at what I was doing. And uh, and uh, and then when uh, I was reading some of his email, I was 
suddenly feeling that my knowledge was basically close to zero. And, uh, and then I had to read uh, many uh, things in order to build back, you know, a confidence. And, uh, you know, when after a few years, you know, he was starting to say that actually what I was doing was good. Then I was feeling, like, ah, you know. <laughs> so it's about, yeah, learning and building confidence. And then suddenly some people will destroy your confidence and then you have to rebuild your confidence to get back to the thing. And, it's, and then one day you arrive to a new deposit and then all your certitude, all your, the confidence that you build, you know, suddenly collapse and you don't know anymore how to separate uh, Sapphire from this area and that area because you have this new deposit that is basically messing up with everything you know. And it takes you maybe one uh, or two months of studying the stone from this deposit in order to build again your confidence. Yeah. So th this is what is great and what is disturbing in science is that expect the unexpected. You Today you feel that you know and tomorrow something else, something new will come up and your whole confidence will be destroyed. And, and one thing, we didn't speak about this specifically, but when you visit mining, if it's a big area with, you know, well, it doesn't really matter. There could be 10 people mining, 50 people mining. But I, I've said this to many people. Sometimes, or very often, it's somebody, a very modest person, who have very good observational skill, who have the good eye, the good brain, picture memory, and who put things together. And you need to find this person. You speak, and sometimes the mind of miners know it, sometimes not. But this person can give many leads. So what does it look like near the pocket or the vein? What did, well, the vein, it changed direction, and then it was this, and we never seen this clay before. It was leaking water. There are many, many signs. I mean, I could write a whole many pages of signs for, for pockets. But usually then... We have, we have, I will say, you have, every, you have something to learn from every person we meet in our lives. It's only if we take the opportunity to do it. And of course, in a special field, we have to, something to learn from, from every miner who was observant and possibly from the other ones too, even about the geology and mining. So, so many times they observe some small signs that is specific maybe for that pegmatite. Maybe there is one, two other areas known in the world where there's also similar signs, but there are many, many such things. I mean, we could write several volumes only about structures in pegmatite and science. So many. Exactly. I, I found that in most of the basically old mining area. Of course, in new area like Gem Rush, you don't find people who spend, when, when the place was discovered last week, you don't find people who have spent a lot of time there. But you find interesting people from other places and they all have theories. But in, in, a, in a many different areas, if, for example, in Pakistan, I remember specifically about one area, you know, you have guys who know they are about 40 or 50 years old, and they have basically 45 experience with that mountain. Yeah, exactly. Because they are from that village, and they know every, like you, you know, I don't know when they started, but if the guys were like you, and they started at four years old, starting to That's go everywhere, right. you know, and they know everything about this mountain. Yeah. So when you start to tell them about the stone, and they show you something. And after two or three days, I remember a guy who was, then he came and he showed me something else and showed something else. Then you know that this guy has something to, to say. And, and when you can communicate with these people, they are usually a, a, a mine of information. Absolutely. I, I, I met some guys in Tanzania, like my usual uh, local contact. He, he had about uh, 30 years experience going around you know, visiting all the mining areas in Tanzania. And he had a great memory. And he spent a, a lot of time in each of them. And he knew in each of them the guy who really knew the place better than him. When you have a guy like that who knows in every place, a guy who really knows the place, and he, he remember about everything that happened, all the names. And, because people in this place, oh, very often, they are not really uh, too much in reading and writing. But they are trained about storytelling, like, you know, uh, uh, they, they get information from listening and they communicate with words. So they have great memory for stories. You have people in the bush in Africa who can tell you for hours and hours about the behavior of a lion or leopard, just, you know, looking at the grass, the way the grass was moved, 
for, for them, it's as clear for me as a book. And this is just impressive. And, and some people with minds, like, like we were down in a, in a, in Maryland, in Tanzania, and I remember this miner explaining me how he was following the zebra, basically explaining me how he was able to find Tanzanite. He was looking, he said, you see the, 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 the zebra is going like that. On the, when the zebra is like that, you know, we found that. And that was such a fascinating moment when this guy was saying that, that my cameraman who was traveling with me took that follow the zebra as a title for the, for the movie we made. And, and you are so right about that. If you find the right local person who has knowledge about area and you are able to listen to them and, and ready, to the, ready to do that, you will get a lot of information. Yes, I, I will tell you one very short example of the question, but I went to one mine, had had contact with this guy who was working in the mine for a long time, several years, I sent him a lot of nice things for exchange and so on. Then I went to visit him. So we looked at his collection. Okay, where did this come from? From this mine, this ore body, this level, he knew this. Okay, what did the pocket look like? What was the rock around? What shape was the pocket? Where in the pocket were the crystals? I asked detail. He said things, but I understand this is not correct. He did not have the attention of somebody who really found it. He was telling stories, but it was not correct. So I was questioning about every pocket, every piece he had there. And he said, well, maybe we should go and speak with another miner. So late in the evening, we went to speak with another miner. And the next day, I spent many days with the other miner uh, following days, because that was the miner had found it. And this guy, he was telling, oh, no, no, this is nothing special. I can take that. No, no, find better and bigger and nicer shapes and better. So, I told this miner that the things you found are really, really fantastic. And the miner had things, but he had given this guy most of it. And he could tell everything, all details. He was one of the best miners in the world who had recorded everything in his head. Unbelievable. Really. And this is also the different types. This miner, he's artistic, he's musical. And that's one key for, for being able to capture all this. We, we do need to analyze, look at the trace elements and analyze both minerals and rocks and so on. But there's so many things that are not so easily put on paper or digits. How much do you love, you, love your wife? 8.35. No, no, no. 8.73. You know, everything that is the most important, you cannot easily put digits on. Yes, we have big, big uh, use of this. But if I say, here is a painting and had 2.63% of this color. And this number percent, 15.23 of this. And this is Mona Lisa. But I find another painting, exactly the same number. It's not the same painting. So, I mean, the world is so much more complex. And I have found that the best miners are always those who are musical and artistic. Besides, usually, they are also, they are using really both sides of their brain. If you're using just one side of the brain, you do not capture these things the same way. So the way of communication is completely different. So the miners that I get most information from are, are really those uh, who are talented in, in everything and using both, both brain sides. This is my interpretation after all these years of going to mines. I have, uh, yeah, that reminds me exactly the, the miner I told you about, uh, he, the, the guy I told you about when I, in a Kataragama, when I, I spoke with him and he, he took two hours, about two hours, I was trying to, to get the guy speaking. And I was speaking about pockets and I was pocket, 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 pocket. Nobody understand what I say. And the day when I, when we moved to pumpkin, that word opened everything. Exactly. Then they realized we, we had, you know, we, we, we've, I found a word in their language that had the definition of the word in my language. And in many cases, people are speaking, uh, throwing words at each other, like this day, you know, ethical, responsible, blah, 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 blah. They don't have the same definition, so they cannot communicate. They, okay, we agree, everything the thing has to be ethical, or the things have to be like that, like that. They agree on the word, but they don't agree on the definition of the words. And, and this is making things very complicated. But with that minor, that we spend two hours agreeing on, word definition when we found the definition of the word that was okay 
then everything was easy. Yeah, and, and I agree with you on the music, but uh, on the the type of uh, of guy that I found that most of the time when I, I, I go to different mining areas, uh, hunters are very good. <laughs> if you have a guy who is a good hunter or a good uh, tracker, yeah. basically he learn how to observe the ground and he knows about hunting and tracking. Uh, that guy usually, if he's a good poacher or a good hunter, he might be, you know, a good, uh, he might become a good miner because he had developed observation skills about nature. Uh, I, I spoke with many hunters when I started, when I was a kid in farmers and hunters, I spoke with them, most, many of the farmers are really not hunters. And they could tell, okay, up on this cliff, on this side, you have this, it looks like ice, coarse crystals. And in this mountain here, there's some purple stones and they could, they could describe because they're very observant, but it's the same personality, whether they're hunters or or farmer or what you know, but, but and when when you go to the forest and you are <coughs> I, was, uh, I was hunting when i was young i i can you know you and i was bow hunting <laughs> so use a bow and sometimes uh, when you try to approach a deer by bow hunting in a one hour you are doing five meters you are walking very slowly and you observe around and you observe around and you observe around and you are looking for small difference because what you want when you are trying to hunt a deer with bow hunting is, number one, the deer can see better than you. He can smell better than you. He can hear better than you. So basically, and you are in his territory and they are territorial. So they know everything about the place where they are. And you have to beat them in their territory on both eye, sound, and smell. And that's the challenge. It's not about, you know, uh, putting an arrow on the deer and be able to harvest the deer. It's about, you know, you are a human person, you live there, and you have to go, you know, in the forest, and you have to beat the world champion of this area. And, and if a guy can do that, I can tell you, a guy living in the mountain. And if he start to have an interest for stone, a good hunter who has an interest for stone will probably have observation skills that on this area and will be able to read the mountain like you cannot believe. And, and this is what I found in this guy. Yeah. Good hunter you know, who know very well their place, if they have an interest in mineral, can be very valuable source of information. Absolutely. Peter, uh, somebody had asked a question when you were speaking about reading, reading pegmatites for pockets. Can you speak a little bit more about some of the features that you see in pegmatites that tell you that there's a pocket? Yes. So, it, it, you know, I should say that it depends on the pegmatite field. So there are many, many different types of crystallization in pegmatite. So some signs are good just to tell that this pegmatite is highly developed in the way that crystallizations and cooling and the mineralogy was good to have big chance to find interesting minerals. They don't need possible, they don't need to be in the pocket, but a good chance to find pockets or rare earth elements or lithium minerals or you know, barrel pockets, whatever it is. So there are many things in the structure itself. But if we were speaking about um, coming near the pockets, there are many, many signs. And in fact, I should say that each pegmatite field may have one, two, or three different types of what is coming near the pocket. You could have, for instance, a quartz string shooting out of the pocket. So you follow this quartz band. And I told many people about this, and one miner, he found an incredible pocket, thanks to that. Uh, you could have just water leaking out. That's how they found the Jonas pocket. I was lucky to meet Ailton Barbosa in 1985. I could only speak Spanish, he spoke Portuguese, but he spent hours explaining to me everything how he found. And there was some water leaking out, so he opened up, and there was a small pocket with green terminal needles. And after that comes bum, bum, the big pocket with Jonas Terminal. Uh, you can have uh, tree roads going down, follow the tree roads, they will find the pockets, uh, I said vegetation. Usually you get the structure. So for instance, if you have easy way, is to look like big tourmalines. They grow, they crystallize with the pegmatite, I mean, with the other minerals. So they're pointing to whether it's possibly a pocket. 
of course, if the pocket, everything is three dimensional, so they could point here and the pocket was here and is already eroded on the mountainside. So you don't know, or it, it could have been the other way. And the thing is, when you see those structures, I always tell people that when you see the good signs, don't drill and blast, start to go. You can drill one drill hole. You can do a gastroscopy almost, you know, and have a look, you know, with the fiber optics, what's in there. If you see a pocket in there, then you work by hand. So when it comes to pegmatize, you need to get blocky structure or you can have graphic structure, graphic granite right around pocket. These are just two, two things, but it really depends on which pegmatite uh, field you are in, where did this form, the depth, the chemistry, the physical conditions that allow the various uh, to shape. Like in Ukraine, the chamber pegmatites, they're round balls like a big football, like a really big melon in the granite. They have different shapes depending on mineral content. I've studied many enough to understand. But even if you manage to find a pocket that's 10 meter big, you need to understand where are the crystals in the pocket. If you have hundreds of cubic meters of rubble and clay, and maybe there is 100 kilo of gem barrel or topaz in there, but you may spend one, two years digging and you didn't find anything. So you really need to, to study very careful, but they're very specific, those pegmatized. Uh, the chamber pegmatized. So if you have a vein, the narrower the vein, the easier it is. The more regular the vein, the easier it is. Himalaya vein is one and a half kilometer, one and a half kilometer long. It's it's just like a sheet. So if you're mining this sheet, you find a pocket here. Solutions came up. So if you find a pocket here, usually you have a strange of several pockets in that zone. But you have to study all along the pegmatite. So there might be some sections that are better. I've been there many enough times. I dug six different nice terminal pockets of pigment. So I know a little bit about that particular vein, but that's a very easy. That's why I advise the people in Pakistan exactly the same style of crystallization, thin veins with plenty of pockets. So I said, mine here, and they found incredible aquamarine. So chemistry, not the same, but structure was the same. Okay. So uh, if this person can, can write later, but it depends on which pegmatite region you are, some pegmatites are big. When you have big pegmatites, you have secondary processes within the pegmatite. If you have a thin vein, it crystallizes. You can have some small secondary, but if you have a huge pegmatite that's 20 meter thick, some are 40, 50 meter, 100 meter, you have internal processes that are forming completely other structures that uh, you have to interpret and understand different zones and within the pegmatite, you can have bends, you can have shoot-offs, splitting, you can have, as I said before, rocks falling in. So there's like a huge number of signs and depending on the whether the, some of the most complex are in terrain where the pegmatite in metamorphic terrain, pegmatite is winding, you may find one incredible pocket and then you don't find anything for 100 meters. So sometimes pegmatites have one big pocket. That's all. This happens. Yeah. Moro Redondo was one such. 18 tons of terminal in one pocket. They drilled and mined, but they never found another. Jonas mine was one big pocket with the rope light. They found a second one with one ice piece. And I was there visiting the mine way, way, way down below. But the structure was not the same. There was never this great structure like uh, up where they found the rope light. They found some green and pockets. I heard a story when uh, I was visiting uh, uh, Namibia about, uh, you know, uh, an old German guy was telling me a story about uh, the, we were visiting a, a, an area near Usakos and uh, he was explaining us uh, some uh, story about uh, pigmatite mining and there was a, a kind of a huge mine. And he said, You know, the local people at one point, they knew that uh, they hit a pocket because, you know, they were exactly as you say, they were drilling and then they were blasting. And when they blasted, all the smoke was blue <laughs> because they blasted the, back, the, the pocket and they blasted tourmaline and the tourmaline was blue and all the smoke was blue. So they blasted the whole thing. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> when you say that, yeah, when you see start to see that, you you just make a small hole, but you don't blast because they found a kind of uh, they, they 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 dig something and then they found oh okay it's going good so we can put the explosive and then they blasted the whole pocket. This happens many many places. I've seen it even when they when they do that. And if you're drilling and suddenly the drill drops four meter, you have to think. So I know in one deposit that I haven't that I would like to pump out, this was a pegmatite they were mining down. And they stopped mining, why? Because it was a huge hole filled with clay. That's why they stopped mining. They wanted feldspar, feldspar and, and mica. So that was a problem to, to just a big hole filled with clay. They, that's not what they were looking for. And, and this is why when you have a mine, this is something that, uh, for example, I, I see with Greenland, it's not just the geologists uh, that who are basically in charge of the operation that uh, have to be careful. It's uh, the people who are drilling, the people who are in the pit, the workers in the mine, because these people again we are coming back to the same thing: the quality of the observation skills of the people at the mine. If you have a guy who is drilling and then he found that suddenly, well, the drill is going like a one meter without. So what, what is down there? There is a cavity. Are you uh, hitting a fault? So if there is anything, you know, something that is a little bit unusual in their daily thing, and if they don't report that, and if they don't think about what may happen, and they just say, okay, well, it's easier. We put the explosive there and we blast the whole thing. Of course, after that, all your production will get blasted. And if this is the best pocket of the year, Basically, all your profit and all your basically return on investment, you just blasted in because uh, you didn't listen to the guy who was reading the pit. We should try to get the, some of the answer. Maybe we'll get, uh, answer the questions. I see here Adolfo de Basilio. Hello, Adolfo. Uh, is Franklin Mineral Museum about the largest species mine in the world? I think he means the Franklin Sterling Hill, we should say, Franklin Sterling Hill. So it's an interesting deposit in New Jersey. They found a huge number of new mineral species there. And the number of species is very large that occur there. But there are in fact several uh, regions of the world where they have you know, great number of uh, mineral specimens. Mount St. Hilaire, uh, up on Kola Peninsula, there are uh, several uh, intrusions, which is alkaline. So it doesn't have all this quartz, but other minerals. So alkaline, nepheline, cyanitic, pegmatites, and so on, with great number of newly discovered minerals and also incredible rich in minerals. There are quite a few. There are some pegmatites, uh, which are very rich in minerals. Also one in South Dakota, one on the East Coast. Uh, there is, of course, Sumed mine has rich, Longbon in Sweden. So there are many different types of deposits that have a great number of species. That's what you mean. So uh, Longbon in Sweden, it is special because it's, a, it's in fact a, a mixture. It is an iron manganese deposit, but there's a lot of brilliant minerals, arsenates and so on. So there's like a huge spectrum of minerals there. Uh, in pegmatites, often phosphates create a huge number of uh, species. I hope that answers your question. So Antoinette, uh, yeah, fluorescent minerals, the Franklin Sterling Hill is extremely rich, I would say, Longbon is also, but uh, it's, I would say it's the king uh, on the planet for fluorescent minerals, that's true. Antoinette Matlins is asking, so if I understand you both, you're saying that labs need samples from all the sources which could vary within relatively short distance of each other, even a few miles of each other. In order to say anything about the origin with certainty, is this accurate? And if so, how do we communicate this to the public? I have an idea. I'd love to discuss it with you both. So, of course, like Vincent said about the sapphires, they can look very different in different places. Now, the, of course, Jamal has studied the enclosures, all the types of enclosures, if they've been induced by, by mankind, by the heat, and, and so on, or even radiation. Um, so, there are many things you will study, the, the geochemistry, trace analysis, you look at the inclusions, of, of course. And I think just as big collection as possible, like Vincent has created, is very important. When it comes to mineral 
specimens. The mineral world is rich in mineral shows where you can see specimens with exact origin. It's very, very important in the mineralogical world. So going to mineral shows like Tucson or other shows, you can in fact see millions and millions of minerals. And when you've been trained, when you've been looking at minerals for 20, 30 years, then you know enough so you can you can tell exactly which mine, which mine this is very easy, of course. If you have a good color, color and good uh, photo memory, of course, and if you've been exposed to enough. But, but for the labs, of course, as, as big spectrum as possible. And like Vincent said, you have to answer now, Vincent, you're about uh, some are overlapping from geochemistry, some uh, place you come and you don't really know what to think because the material doesn't look like you've seen before. So, of course, you need to have a good data, and that's what Vincent is doing in analyzing the material both from enclosures and geochemistry. But maybe you can. I'm you, not doing that. All the people are doing that. I'm yeah. Basically, uh, uh, the expensive machines that they have in lab and the experienced people and the valuable people are working on a uh, trustable material. Yes. That's basically my part. And then I'm helping them on other thing and I learned a lot from their work, but I'm not actually the guy doing LAICPMS uh, or tracing it. Method to do it. For example, uh, fabricating the sample or taking photographs of them, uh, Justin can tell you about. You know, um, I, I, I'm not... I have some understanding and I have some experience of that, but I, at one point you have to um, to integrate a team and you have to work in a team with people who are much better at what they are doing than you are. And you just have to focus on what you are really good at. Yes. So Antoinette, she's adding, yes, she understands this. Of course, she's expert. She's real expert in gemology, much more so than I. So what I'm suggesting is that the public seems to think that only Burma rubies are the best, etc. But for but some from Tajikistan, Shnezhna, Nadeshta uh, veins are equally beautiful and equally ancient. So my idea is to educate the public about many sources of fine material, which is very true. And uh, of course, you know, people have, uh, you know, people's limits. Some they are happy if they can name five gem species. And then it adds up if they know even where, where something is coming from, it's, it's good. And of course, some, somebody seriously interested can, can name all, almost every serious mine on the planet for one specific species and know what it looks like and so on. So, of course, education is, is very important. And I think this is one way to do it. We are not showing any materials here, but at least we're discussing some concept. Uh, well, education is a... Yeah, education is great, but, but for example, to be edu able to educate people on new gem deposit, you need to be able to show samples. Yes. People need to be able to study them, basically write articles, books. Uh, Tajikistan, for example, if uh, people want to educate about Tajikistan, number one, academic people should be able to access the mind, to study the mind, which is extremely difficult. So yeah. that's and then collect some material, show some good material. So when people are able to see some nice material, of course, the location become more famous. Burma is so famous, Mogok is so famous because people are mining there for nearly uh, maybe 900 years or maybe 1,000 years. Uh, from Tajikistan, it's probably not the same. Yeah. So all the time, uh, basically, the uh, mining areas that are kind of old, will there will be more people who have written books on an article about them, and this mine will, that are called then classic, uh, get an advantage. And if you want to compete with that, and basically uh, write uh, articles that will be read, or, or and books that will be read by people, there is only one way to do is to start. And I don't see many uh, books with beautiful photographs about uh, all this new place. Because again, we come back to the same thing as we were saying at the beginning. The sad thing is that many people don't read anymore. So how to educate the public when the public don't read or have so many different interests that they are not really interested in the topics that you want to put in a book. Most of people, when I speak about books, they say, Vincent, I don't want to, I'm not interested to finance a book in which, in uh, where the title 
where people don't even know what is in the, what, what is in the title. So for example, if you put a word like pigmatite or spinel and try to educate the public about that, how many people even with gemological education understand what is a pigmatite? How many books you can sell about pigmentite? That's why there are not so many books written about pigmentite or spinel. Many, but to get the, the concept, you need to gather quite a few. Therefore, I, I try to show the shortcut ones where you can learn huge, where we're very well written, you can learn a great amount of information. And of course, that the author for each one has cut their knowledge. This is years and years, decades of experience and research and it's cut down so you could write much, much more, but you know, it's to have the time to do it. And it's also costly to travel, to take your time to sit. So for instance, uh, I take off I, during the, well, since I was in my twenties, I took off without working, not working or take time off from work. So I use my holidays. And then if I take time off from work, I use that for, for being with, with my wife and children. So it's also costly. So I don't, I took one group of friends to Namibia, for instance, 10 people, 10 Americans, they're all paid in principle to do the research. I'm not. But for me to take two weeks off, I lose half a month's salary and I pay for the trip. So it's very costly. For me, it's extra costly. And I went to one conference in New Hampshire, it was a wonderful conference, but my cost, I pay airline ticket for me, my wife, rental car, hotel. Fee for me and my wife, you know, I cannot only travel without her. I try to bring her as many places that I can afford to. But sometimes she has to stay home. And we went to Brazil three weeks and she had to climb up and down in mines every day for three weeks. So that's not every woman's uh, dream holiday, but she enjoyed it. <laughs> so, so for us to publish something is also very costly because if you're going to sit down and take your time, and that is take time from your family or take time from, from work during, take your holidays to writing. I prefer to go to mine, so, and you know, to publish it will cost you money, you will not get the money. That's what I was thinking also for the past uh, uh, 10 years, because I was all the time thinking that, you know, if visiting mine for 10 years or 20 years is good to write, if you want to write a book, but maybe 30 years is better, you know, when, Ten more years because there are still few minds that a uh, few places that I want to visit before to write a book. So I all the time feel that number one, I don't have enough knowledge to write a book because I know that there are still many things that I would like to learn, and uh, and then I cannot afford to spend one. When I discuss with people like Richard, how long time it took you to write a book? And most of the people I know who wrote a book, it took them several years. I'm, I was discussing today with a friend. He's working on a book for the past seven or eight years. And, um, and when you want to write a book, you have to learn about how to write, how you want, how you're learning to write by reading a lot and by writing articles, uh, be able to summarize and to make everything, you know, put everything in a kind of concise way. And you need to get the book centered about one idea and find something who will, uh, so something that will really interest the people. So it's not uh, as easy as it uh, writing a book. Some people say, well, just make a coffee table book uh, with image. Yeah, so many people have done that already. So I don't think uh, why I should add one more, but uh, no, it, it, it's not easy. And then if you write a book, you cannot force people to read it. So not easy. Now we got some. And Mubashir Mansour is asking, I wonder if there are any softwares based on the methodology you're using to scan entire Google Earth. I have never scanned entire Google Earth. When I was a kid, I was lucky. I had Hasselblad cameras in my home city. They were used to photograph the moon the first time. They had tens of thousands of satellite images. So I was a kid. I had a friend there. I went down. I went through and I was allowed to make copies. So I studied the planet from via Hasselblad, via satellite images. And now with Google Earth, it's really luxury because you can zoom in, you can pay some money for yes. professional version, and you can look and you combine it with topographical map and uh, you don't scan, you look and you look in detail. So one talk I, I gave a few years ago, I was showing from Google Earth and it was one good friend, he's a geologist, very, very good geologist, but he never used Google Earth for that. And he was like, whoa, really? He was yeah. all night, he was up and he said, I found this mine in this, 
he didn't find the correct mine. He found a mine near a village that I was speaking about. But the, the real mine, I, sp I know dozens of mine around this village, but they're very high and very, very far from the village. So he found the one mine near the village that he spent all, he was up all night, you could see him in his eyes the next morning. But he was so excited, he never really used it before, you know. I spent many, many evenings uh, uh, using Google Earth. Justin, you remember the discussion we had with uh, Gary Boasox? Yeah. Basically, you want the software, for example, on Afghanistan. The software is called Gemstone from Afghanistan by Gary uh, Boasox. You take the book, you have all the GPS data of all the known deposits at the end. Then with all that, you go on Google Earth and you look at the area around. I can tell you that when you have a book with maps and GPS data, you go around with Google Earth, you can spend one or two months in confinement looking at all the, uh, you know, the place in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan area, or also, you know, in uh, other place in Africa. Uh, it's huge. What you can do is huge. Before going to a mining area, to going on a field expedition, I all the time spend minimum five or six hours looking at all the, the area that I want to visit on Google Earth. And the great thing is you can go back in time. You have some image, satellite image, that were taken like uh, one or two years ago, some other six or seven years ago and things like that. So you can also go, you know, when you have a, uh, a specific uh, area, you can go back in time and see that, oh, five years ago, there was a mine there on the other side of the mountain. And when you reach the mining area and you start to speak with a guy in the village and you tell them that, yeah, about five years ago, there was a mine on the other side of the mountain, I can tell you the guy don't take you anymore for a tourist. So <laughs> sometimes it's uh, quite interesting what you can get with Google Earth. It's just fascinating. Uh, and Google it was not available, but now it's available. Yes, I, when Google Earth came, I started looking in many areas of the world, but I remember specifically I looked in Afghanistan and I marked every vein that I thought would be interesting and one that I said, wow, this looks really, really good. And that was just from Google Earth. And I made print and that computer is, I have many, many computers later, so I don't have the Google Earth version, but I made prints of what I thought. And it was funny, a few years ago, I went in and I had found this and I went in and there, then you could, from origin, you couldn't see the mine tunnels. Now you could see the mine tunnels in the pegmatite. Maybe there was one small tunnel at that time, but now you can see several tunnels. And mm -hmm. I did also one area of Vietnam. I looked and I just looked at the geology and it's jungle as we spoke about before, but I looked at topography, a couple of lakes. And just from topography, I said, well, this looks like a granite intrusion. So I searched, I found the, the geological map, and it was exactly with the granite intrusion. This looks really good. It was just jungle cover, but geological map was confirming what I was suspecting, just from topography. And in 2004, 2005, 2006, the quality of the photo on Google Earth was, in many areas, was so-so. Now, when you see what some of the mining areas, I remember, I went a few years ago and, you know, after a few years, you return on Google Earth and you look at exactly the same place you were look, watching a few years ago. The quality of the, of the, of the photo is way much better. Uh, you go in Vietnam uh, for uh, Yente and Sinada, you see all the alignment because in Vietnam, it's funny, you have the, the rubies, the blue spinel and the pink, uh, purple spinel are in three parallel lines that are basically distance of 10 or 20 meters. And, 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 and it's all going on the same, uh, you know, uh, people don't like to say line, layer, or geologists don't like the word line. They say lay, uh, basically a layer or a, a trend. And, and it's just fascinating because you wonder, okay, I've been to that place, I've been in that, what about in the middle? And then you go with a local guy and you go in the middle and guess what you find? Miners, <laughs> miners, people in the middle, and, and it's just fascinating. Just with Google Earth, Google Earth is such a, a wonderful tool for exploration before a field expedition. Just wonderful. So Antoinette was leaving us. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, we kept on quite a oh, while. Justin, 
Peter, um, a final uh, kind of question before to uh, yeah, this is so, this, this is just my yeah. little this is my little side question from hearing all of this. You, you know, hearing your whole life story, I I wrote a I wrote an article about the British mineralogist John Maul last year. And from hearing your story and, and all the places you traveled to, a lot of the places you've been to overlap, you know, places he was going to 200 years ago. And I just wondered, have you read, you know, when you were just getting into this, did you read much of his stuff or have you, have you read no, much? Many, many people. In fact, I, not based on others travel, you know, I always study deposit as they are. So I travel and probably I'm a little stubborn because I always took the chance to go to the place because like Soviet Union, it was closed. You couldn't go there. So when it opened up, I went to try to see all the deposits that it was not easy to get permission. It took years, but still because I didn't know in one year later, two years, 10 years later, it would be possible. And now other places on the planet have become more difficult to visit. I'm not speaking about the last few months now, but, but even the last few years, sometimes war starts to pop up and you know it's, it's changing all the time. So I always... The localities that I thought that this will always be possible to go to. And if I hadn't been, there was not priority one. I, I always selected some of the most difficult when there was a chance. And also, you know, we're not getting any, any younger. So within 20 years or 30 years, I need to go to Kashmir. Because when I'm getting towards 90, I think it's a bit rough to try to hit up to <laughs> Kashmir. <laughs> it's very high altitude also. Yeah. Okay, well, it, I think it's been a really, really great chat. Um, you know, we, I feel like I personally learned so much about a lot of stuff that I didn't know about. So thanks for, you know, taking the time to, to give us so much of your knowledge and experience. I, I feel like, as you said, you can probably write books and books and books about all this wisdom that you've accumulated, and probably you should before it's too late. But for today, at least, thanks for taking a few hours and letting us get a little download from your, your whole life. Thank you very much. Uh, one last comment from my side. I was invited a few times to China. And one time I was in China, they said, oh, we would like you to come back and, uh, and be here for two weeks and teach us everything you know. And I said, uh, about what, about pyrite or about which mineral? <laughs> How can you teach everything you know within two weeks? That's... <laughs> That's not possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you need to prepare. If you're going to do PowerPoints and run it through in two weeks, of course, you can do that. But then you will need to prepare for a year or something, a year's yeah. work to prepare yeah. them. And of course, it would only be a little bit anyway. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, I agree. Uh, Peter, really, thanks a lot. And for everybody, you know, watching us, if you uh, want to learn a little bit more, about uh, Peter and his pigmatite, I really strongly advise you to uh, go to uh, YouTube on the AIGS channel where you will find a webinar that uh, Peter gave uh, recently, with, which was quite different from this one because this one is uh, basically a discussion we have. But on the one that uh, Peter gave at AIGS, you will see uh, many uh, photographs, many slides, and uh, something more, more graphic. But uh, the reason why it's not the same here is because this is not the same thing. And I just uh, told Peter, please, we don't, we are not here to to do again uh, what you did at uh, AIGS. We are here to uh, to have a discussion about pegmatite on everything around. So, uh, if you want to learn more about pegmatite, you have many good books, and uh, you have uh, uh, this webinar. So please uh, go to get curious, keep uh, curiosity going, and and please don't forget. Uh, to read, read and uh, dare to ask questions and uh, think and then uh, go to explore the world and uh, learn more. That's what I have to say. And uh, thanks, Peter. It's, it's Thank the only time a pleasure to, uh, to meet you, even if it's uh, virtual uh, this time, and, uh, and to, to, have, uh, to be able to uh, spend some time with you. Every time when we had lunch with each other, uh, I was thinking that, that uh, this lunch are, are getting, uh, are, are really too short. And, uh, and today I had exactly the same feeling. Now after this talk, I'm thinking about a few things that I have to read about, and maybe we can discuss about that next time. <laughs> very good. And thank you very much for all the audience, for those who could, who used all the time until now, it's, 
marvelous. You had yeah. this in the audience. There was Odulio in the audience. I, <laughs> now I want to have some question. I want to discuss with Odulio in order to because Odulio is the other for me. There are the two guys that are the world expert on Pegmana are you and Odulio. <laughs> Odulio was there. He was listening to everything we say. So I want to <laughs> I want to have a discussion with Odulio now. <laughs> Uh, that would be very good. <laughs> okay, so next week uh, we'll have another passionate uh, uh, geologist coming to uh, speak with us. Tomorrow, uh, next week, uh, we will uh, welcome uh, Dr. Cedric Simone. So Cedric is uh, is an old friend, and he has a kind of incredible background because uh, Cedric uh, is uh, both an academic and a field person. He had a, he made his PhD studying the Johnson Ruby mine in uh, in Kenya. He was a general manager from the mine. He did his PhD with North University, and then he stayed there around uh, in uh, Kenya and uh, all around Africa for for many years. And he is probably uh, uh, the or one of the geologists with the best experience about uh, working in a in Africa, and uh, I think that uh, he's my main contact in Kenya. Every time I go to Kenya, I contact Cedric. Uh, regularly, we have a discussion, and he's uh, one of the most uh, interesting guy I know uh, to uh, discuss with and to spend some time in the field with. And uh, I think that uh, if you have some time next week, it will be great if you could consider joining us for this uh, webinar with uh, Cedric Simonet. So um, I wish you a, a great week. Please uh, be safe. And uh, so far, you know, as you know, the only safe uh, way to deal with this uh, COVID-19 is probably to wear a mask and to wash your hands regularly and uh, to try to uh, keep a little bit some distance in order not to spread uh, the virus everywhere or getting uh, this virus. So be safe and uh, be safe for yourself and be safe for everybody around you. So I hope that uh, everything will be fine and we'll meet again next week. This talk, of course, will be on uh, YouTube in a few days, like the talk from last week uh, by Richard Hughes uh, that uh, hopefully uh, will be online on uh, YouTube uh, in the next few days. I, I don't want to say when because it not really depend on me, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we are working on that. It's coming sooner so, or later. Have a good night and uh, see you next week. And thanks again, Peter, for... Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. See you later, Peter. Goodbye. Look forward to meeting you in real life next time. And thanks, Justine. Again, great job. Yeah, see thank you guys. You. Vincent, I'll see you next week. <laughs>